You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got T. How are we, brother? Oh, TM, T, T, TM. You've got many names, but we'll go for TM today. How are you? I'm doing great. Fascinating. Thanks for me. Yeah, anytime. Thanks for coming to New York. Um, very fascinating story from a man who was neo Nazi, KKK, to then changing his life and trying to help others. Back in the day, you had a heavy heart, probably a dirty heart, a heart full of hate. But it shows that people can change. It shows what can be done by changing the mindset that anything is possible a man you probably thought one time you wouldn't you would have been died in that life so it's very fascinating to understand that i've never had a man i'll usually interview murderers bank robbers drug lords so it's interesting to have a man who was involved in that lifestyle and how mm. he made the changes but first and foremost how are you brother i'm doing good we have a great time here in new york thanks for having me um it's it's cold it's um, we live in Memphis, so we used to be in that warmer subtropical climate. Yeah. So, but New think, York is still nice. If you think this is cold, brother, you should come to Scotland. This is summertime for us. That's why I'm cutting about in shorts. <laughs> is uh, Before we get into everything, no, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get more about of an understanding about you, where you grew up, how it all began. I grew up in Germany, very, very, very small town in 1975. Southern Germany, very conservative. Um, there was nothing going on. There was no shops. There was no restaurants. There was no pubs. Um, and a very tight-knit community. My parents just had moved there a year or two before I was born. They had a drinking problem. Uh, and then they got divorced. And it was 1975. So that was kind of a problem. That's not something you would do. It was like, nope, you stay married. You get through this, you know. So that was one of the problems that my mom had as a, just a lone mother, drinking. My siblings are all older than me, 7, uh, 11, and 13 years older. So you can see that gap, you know, nothing happened for 7, 8 years, and then TM happened, literally. My mom was like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with him, <laughs> really. Uh, so and I think her main mission was just to, to get me through school so I get a job and make it in life. How were you at school? At, at the beginning, good. Um, I think I was, uh, it was underwhelming for me. Um, it was not really interesting. It got boring really quick. I hated homework. I was an outsider. I'd get bull I was bullied. So I skipped school a lot, starting in third grade already. And then when I went to another school in fifth grade, first two years were great. Um, especially we started learning English in fifth grade. That was my, my big thing. I was always this fan of the American dream I had that and that emigrated to San Diego in 1956. That was my, my thing. I want to be here in the U.S. I want to learn English. And, and the teachers liked me. And seventh grade, it just declined. I had no interest in, anymore, in, the, in that anymore. Again, I was bullied. I was just different than the, than the other kids. What did you do after school? Well, the thing was, I got kicked out of school. Why? Um, the first time I got kicked out was because uh, I had to repeat class, and I still didn't behave. I didn't do my homework. I just acted up and everything. So they kicked me out of school, so I went to another school. Um, did the same thing there. So they kicked me out, and in Germany, it's different from the United States where you have homeschooling. It's like you have to finish your nine years or ten years and you have to go to school. So there was an electric school, like a, a small college that they, they took me in. So I did that year and then I didn't go for the second year because I didn't have to. And I was just sitting at home for a while. Did you feel like an outsider? Oh, absolutely. But at that time when this happened, I was already involved in that movement. That happened all before that. Um, like in school, I was an outsider because I felt like I was different than the others. They had, like, let's say an identity. 
One was a Boy Scout. The other one, they were, were involved in, in, in the church. Another one, they were soccer fans. You know, you're from mm -hmm. the UK, so, you, you know, it's a big thing there. In Germany, too, they're crazy about that stuff. And I was really, you know, my father was not there. He died when I was, when I was eight. They divorced when I was about two. So I grew up without a father. My brother moved out when I was six. So I actually grew up with my mother and two sisters. And the other sister also moved out when I was about seven. So technically only my mother and, and one sister. So there was no really male role model there. And I just was interested in, in you know, learning English into music. My sister listened to a lot of music, mostly English language music, a lot of British glam rock, the sweet T-Rex and Queen, a lot, the Beatles, uh, also Elvis, Michael Jackson. Uh, a lot of that's rock music, hot guitar riffs, you know, screaming guitars, loud voices, but I didn't understand anything. So it was, I, I liked it, but it was empty messages. And I was interested in writing short stories. I was interested in drawing comics and I always felt my mom didn't care. You know, she had a drinking problem, so I and I didn't really know that because she wasn't laying around drunk, so she hid it very well, and I had no idea. I just thought she doesn't want me, or she's not interested really in what I want and my talents. So it was just okay. We put him in some good fancy school clothes, while the other kids had like polo shirts and jeans. I had some fancy pants and fancy shirts, you know, and kids laughed at it. And uh, really good school supplies over the top. The other kids had just what was in, and I didn't. And then about seventh, eighth grade, that was when we started learning about the Holocaust and World War II and these things. And, you know, that's exactly the age when kids are in puberty. When they start growing up, you know, discovering their, their masculinity, and they wanted to be the bad boys, you know. And so some of the kids started telling the typical racist schoolyard jokes. Racist, homophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic. And also making fun of Hitler. Because it's like in a Baptist church, you don't make fun of the devil. It's too serious. You can't do that. And it was similar in Germany. You didn't make fun of Hitler. It was way too serious. You couldn't do that. It was a taboo. But those kids did it. And of course, everybody looked up to them. They're cool. And unfortunately, I was also a very good joke teller. So I picked those jokes up, even invented a couple of new ones. And so a couple of kids started coming to me because they wanted to hear those jokes. So I uh, was somebody all of a sudden. Um, I took everything to the extreme. And I think I'm an extreme person. Whatever I do, I do it with an extreme passion, extreme over the top. I don't have a stop button. And I did it there too. So I invented some new jokes and I started drawing all these jokes down as a comic in a little book. And the kids stole it. And of course, you know, all the kids were coming wanted to see the book. And with all the bad Holocaust jokes in it, but also making fun of Hitler and all this stuff. And, um, one kid stole a comic and gave it to the principal, and boy, I was in trouble. Really, really bad. But the thing is, from that day on, I was known as the Nazi kid in school. And I didn't feel like it was a Nazi, because we just learned in school, the Nazis were hung in 1946 in Nuremberg. I didn't know anything about skinheads or neo-Nazis or whatever. I just knew about this, uh, this topic, you know? And... Um, I didn't, I didn't understand how can you call me Nazis when there's no Nazis anymore. And hey, I was making fun of Hitler too. So I didn't feel like I was a Nazi. But I felt like they put me in a box and closed the lid and nobody was looking at that boy in the box anymore and just labeled it. That's what society does, labeling everything. And at some point, I just started to accept the label. And hey, I have an identity now. I'm somebody. And the bullying stopped. In some insta instances, I even became the bully. So I don't know if it was respect. Maybe it was for some kids more fear. I don't know. But the bullying stopped. And that was good enough for me. How big an effect is it when the father figure isn't there with no discipline, 
no understanding of life, no one to put you in check from your mistakes. How big an impact is it to come from a broken home? I think it's extremely important and, and it has a lot to do with that. The missing father figure, not only the missing identity, because in the family it's a little bit tricky too. The, I remember the one kid had like a family tree that went back to like 1600 something and, and my mom was adopted. And my father was from one of the parts of Germany lost after World War II. You know, it's today Czech Republic. So they didn't talk much about it either. So I grew up with just my, my, um, my siblings, my mother, a cousin and, and the two grandmothers. And, and that was a whole family. It was rather small. And again, the father died and there was no male role model at all there. And like you said, nobody who would put me in, in check, just, just, just a mother. And she often didn't even realize what was going on because one thing where I really much later realized how little she actually observed what I was doing, even though I was listening to the hate music at, at some point already. I know at the beginning I started listening to hate music and, and a little bit to, to stuff like Motorhead and, and Saxon and, and British heavy metal at the same time. But half of the music at least was German. She could have understood that. And I remember I took one album to school and had the lyrics on the back and the teacher confiscated it. And my mom had to go to school and they were talking about it. And the teacher asked her, do you actually know what kind of music your son was listen, listening to? And her answer was, I uh, know, I don't speak English. So she didn't even realize the lyrics of the German music that I was listening to. She was completely on track, um, fighting her demons. The alcohol problem, she was working, coming home in the afternoons. Um, we had food and everything, but at, at night she would lock herself in her room and get drunk. So she didn't really pay attention. Did you feel that lack of love growing up? Oh, but you were oblivious to no, it? No, I, I, don't, I don't think I felt unloved. I felt misunderstood. I felt more a lack of some emotional care. I, I, didn't, I didn't think they didn't love me, neither my, my older sister nor my mother, because that's, that's all I knew. And they told me they loved me. And we, we went to places, you know, went to amusement parks. We went to zoos and they made sure I got stuff. And she made sure I got a computer when all the other kids got a computer. It was like when uh, Commodore 64 was brand new. I was 10 years old, you know, and, and um, I got it a little bit later than the other kids. But my mom made sure she provides all that for me. Yeah, it took about but, 10 years to load a fucking game on the Commodore 64. <laughs> yeah, I remember yeah. that. But your mum was trying then. Hey, listen, for an addict to be trying is a noble thing as well because you don't know the understanding of the parents at that age when they're doing bad stuff either. I know that now. Yeah. And fortunately, I had the chance to tell my mother several times and said, I know you did the best you could at mm -hmm. the time. Yeah, because they're only doing what they know and what they've been taught. And it's a sad right. reality because people think, why can't they change? Why don't they love me? If they love me, they could do this and that. But addiction's a powerful thing where it destroys many lives and not just the person who's the addicts, the people around them, the lives it destroyed. So you're coming from the broken home. And this is Absolutely. Why it's a typical, yeah. typical story. Yeah. Like, um, as it comes. But it is because every, I fucking always say it, but the gangsters, the porn stars, the OnlyFans girls, the broken home, they go down that certain route of craving something whether it's respect whether it's fear whether mm -hmm. it's to be in a brotherhood whether it's to join the mafia whether it's to join the nazis or the fucking K the kkk there's something not right in the head where you're craving something from an external force yep. so see when you're doing all the nazi stuff in school that did anybody ever say look enough's enough or were you just gaining that respect where the the abuser becomes the aggressor and you just knew that you had something yep. to work with you know, hurt people hurt people. Yeah. You know? And that's the same. The abuser becomes the aggressor. The the bullied kid becomes the bully. And you don't even think about it. It just feels good to be in charge, not to be bullied anymore. You're somebody. Um, you finally have a purpose. You don't know what it is. You finally have an identity. At least you think you do. Um, it's not the right identity because it's not yourself. But, again, it was better than the bullied kid. And 
uh, being 13, 14, 15 years old, you know, you want to be the bad boy and it fits right in. And that was also when I first got in touch, uh, when I was introduced to hate, hate rock. It was a cassette tape. Like, it was actually very prominent on the schoolyard. A lot of kids listened to that. You have to realize in the, it was the late 80s, you know, in the 50s, 60s, you had rock and roll. In the 70s, you had heavy metal. In the 80s, you had punk. You couldn't shock anymore, anybody anymore with heavy metal or punk in the 80s, right? So the next strong thing you could do is skinhead music, you know? And um, uh, like in Great Britain, some people know that the skinhead movement not always has been racist, you know? In Germany, that's for the most part completely unknown. So if you think of skinhead, that equals neo-Nazis. Mm -hmm. And I got that cassette tape, and that's the first time I heard about these people, and uh, they were singing, uh, that they're misunderstood, they're blamed for everything, even if they haven't done anything wrong, and they're just proud of their country and just, just defending it. And uh, I was like, those guys are singing about me. They don't know me, but they're singing about me. How is that possible? So I got the tape, and at the beginning, it was a very soft message I could identify with at the time, you know? If somebody would have uh, sung about conspiracy theories or uh, about extreme violence or stuff like that, I would not have bought that. But it was a soft message, it resonated, and the next cassette tape was a little bit more aggressive and more aggressive, and I just sh started shouting these slogans, and uh, I was like, I want to get to know these people. Where are they? Where are those skinheads? And uh, at some point, this kid at school told me where they were hanging out. And so I went there, introduced myself, and became part of the gang or group. What was that feeling for you? To, was that the first time you'd ever felt like a family? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It was great because I finally could get out. Before that, I was, I was trapped in a 500-citizen uh, village, and there was... No bus going anywhere. It was two buses. They went to school and back, and that's it. And I was just 15, and I remember I got my cousin's moped, and I could have that. So I took the moped and drove about 10 miles to town where the skinheads were uh, over the weekend, and we got hammered and drove back. Uh, Some money got stolen. Uh, the moped got stolen and broken. And again, my mom drove me then sometimes, and I just walked back. I didn't care. It was just more important to be there, to be with these people that became my family because they understood me. And uh, they also understood, like like those musicians, those, those skinhead bands that were singing. Well, the teachers, they don't understand you. Um, the police doesn't understand you. Your parents don't understand you. But we do understand you. We know where you're coming from. How many people was in this skinhead gang? It was about 15. So very small? It was it was kind of small. And for the most part, we were just hanging out in our hangout and, and, and playing pool, getting drunk, playing darts. And, uh, and sometimes uh, uh, they would start going to some disco, and especially the, the leader of the gang, he was extremely violent, and he always got into some fights. And at the time, I was a rather shy kid, so I tried to stay away from the fights. I, I was not a womanizer at the time, so when the others started getting onto girls, I was staying away a little bit, because I was just, I didn't learn that, you know, and I, I was very self-aware and unsure, and uh, so I, I tried to chicken out very often when, when I saw that. Um, that changed a little bit later when we went to a big, big rally. And you have to understand, at the time, it was not about politics at all. That is what I said. The original skinheads used to be not political. and They don't like authorities. They're in their minds like punks. And they just don't want to drink and fight. And they don't want to have any Nazis or parties control them or, or whatever. Uh, we were pretty much the same in the in the late 90s, like in 1989, 1990. Then the Berlin Wall fell, and the skinheads that came from East Germany, they were already neo-Nazis. So that changed a little bit, and then uh, you had also Great Britain, the Blood and Honor movement coming over, uh, that was uh, introducing 
a lot of a lot more politics in the skinhead movement that was actually not as known. The skinheads were singing about stuff and proud to be Germans and that they didn't want the immigrants and everything, but not really with any political concepts. That changed with the British influence and with the influence of the neo-Nazis from East Germany. And in 1991, there was a big rally we went and um, probably four or 5,000 people there. It's actually insane how many. And I remember driving a couple of hours and we arrived a little bit early and um, before the march started so we sat at a cafe and I remember I really had a coffee and the leader of our group he drank a beer and all of a sudden you saw a skinhead walking by with a towel around his head and I'm like that's well, strange and he turned around and you could see everything was full of blood and somebody told us that some Antifa punks or whatever threw bricks on some skinheads and I'm, I'm honest, I almost shut my pants. I was like, I was 15, you know, I was like, man, this is crazy stuff. I don't know if I want to be here. Um, but I couldn't go home because I wasn't the driver. So I had to stay. And now later we started marching and you had like thousands of people marching and yelling the same slogans. And a couple of people ran to chase some, some punks that were showing up. And, I started yelling with them and running with them, you know, and they started licking blood. So, and then all of a sudden the fear was gone. I was like, this, this is cool. It's mad though, isn't it? How fast you can gravitate towards something. Even like the football hooligans and that as well, there's always something, they feel like a family. Even the mafia guys, when they want to join the mafia, they're killing people, they're doing bad, they don't care as long as they felt part of something. Did you feel that when you started getting a little sense of power and, enjoying the violence and the anger and the frustration would you have done anything to just be part of this movement yeah absolutely because you're in control you're in power you're in charge and you can these were moments where you could show it off um because if you grow up without being in charge you know you feel like you're not valued you have no purpose you feel humiliated you know and you can, you can turn this around. One example is too, I'm actually talking about this in my book, the story will be in it. We were like 14 or 15, me and another kid, and there was in a nearby town, a punk concert. And that punk band was notorious for singing against skinheads and against Nazis. And we were already going in that direction and we're like, oh, why are this, the real skinheads not going there preventing the concert? I didn't know any skinheads at the time. And I was just, Confused, how, how can they go and play that as punk band? So me and the friend decided we are going there <laughs> and waiting for the skinheads and then we just will storm the concert. I don't know what we thought. So we went there with our mopeds, 15 years old. And it was at some clubhouse or whatever and we we're standing there. Um, not bald, bald head, heads yet, but our bomber jackets and patches and our boots and white laces in it. So we were identifiable. And... Uh, buses of punks were coming and two really big guys were coming over and they like spotted us and I was like ah okay and I'm like oh shit I'm in trouble and they coming over spotted my patch that said I'm proud to be a German got a knife out took it out of out from my jacket you know it didn't destroy the jacket took it and kind of sent us home <laughs> and we were, really, we were so afraid you know but I never forgot that moment and later, years later, when I was with another skinhead, and it was like I was in my 20s, we were on a train after a drinking bench, and me and him, and we saw a punk on the train. Nobody else on the train. I was like, here's my moment. That's the revenge. So we went there and started harassing the person, you know. And um, he also had a patch, just like I had. It was just, just some figure who threw a swastika on him trash bin and I was like well you're gonna get rid of this patch take it off He's like, I don't know how I said I don't care use your teeth so we're standing there and watching him using his teeth chewing the patch off so um, we didn't beat him up um, that was just that was good enough for me I, I believe I, I kicked his leg or something when I got off the train and then we started laughing about it. But it was like, 
we showed him that we're in charge, you know? So these are the moments where that empower you, where you turn it around, you know? These these moments of humiliation that you're that you still remember. What is the purpose of the skinheads back then? What was the main purpose? That's a good question. Actually drinking, women, fights. Um I think the whole again at the beginning it was not political. Yeah, there were songs about um send the black people home to Africa, send 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 all the immigrants back. But that it didn't have a political background. That was more because we got in street fights with Turkish gangs all the time. So that that came from there. Why the Turkish? Uh, Germany has a very very big Turkish population, and um, what I didn't understand back then, uh, Turkish kids have a hard time in Germany because their parents and grandparents came in the fifties and sixties sixties as guest workers. And they were supposed to go back after a certain time. They had a contract. Like Germany had a contract after World War II with uh, Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, and, uh, and Turkey. Because you had a lot of Germans that didn't come back from the war. And, um, and the economy was booming, so you had to fill that void. So all these foreigners came in as guest workers. Instead of going back, a lot of them stayed, uh, never really integrated. And then you have their kids born in the 70s, they didn't know where they belong. They're speaking Turkish at home, but they were born in Germany. So when they went back to Turkey, there were the Germans, and in Germany, there were the Turks. They had a hard time. So I think I think they had the same problem that I had as a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, and rather than to understand them, they were the enemies. I actually think, looking back, they had exactly the same problem that I had. Mm-hmm. See, when you're, how long were you in the skinheads before? Because it just seems kids just getting drunk, fighting, pretty minor stuff. When did things start getting serious? So, I got in the first skinhead group in in 1990. How do you get into a skinhead group? Because obviously, like biker groups, you've got to kind of, you get prospects, you've got to go and do stuff. Yeah, no, no, it wasn't like None that. that. It was not like an organized yeah, gang. Yeah, yeah. You had you had a couple of groups like that coming up later. Like there's like again, Blood and Honor from from England was coming over, or the Hammerskins from the US, and they were more organized, like Hell's Angels, where we're a prospect and and so on. Mm-hmm. And then you had to work yourself your way in, and they wouldn't take everybody. But the skinhead group, it was just a, a bunch of people, and either you showed up or you didn't show up, and and. You, um, it it was not 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 uh, an organized gang or or anything like that. Um, I stayed with that group for about two years until ninety ninety two. Uh, I got in a fight with the, with the leader of the group. What happened? Um, he he beat he beat me up, and I was like, okay, screw this. I don't want to be with them anymore. Why did they beat you up? Uh, he he never really liked me. It was um um because I was I was not hard enough. I was chickening out sometimes, and um, and one night I had a crush on a girl, and she was his ex. So I was hanging out with that girl and her girlfriend. Nothing happened. I was way too shy. But um, that's the night when he attacked me and um, beat me up, and I was like, okay, screw this. I'm not going back. And um, I was, I could have just left the whole group, you know, and the whole thing behind me. But again, I had nothing else. That was my whole life. So I just stayed at home for a while and I went to, to some concerts and whatever because we had skinhead groups in every town. They knew each other, but I didn't have a problem with a lot of them. So I just went to other groups. And, and uh, then I finally found a job uh, as an apprentice uh, in Stuttgart, which was about 50 miles away. And, well, first day I showed up there, I got in trouble too. Why? I showed up with a shaved head and, and full uniform and everything, like like my skinhead uniform, and showed off. And, and uh, there was a, a Turkish guy, the Italian, there. They were pretty aggressive, and they just jumped on me and started a fight. And then I had two Germans. They went with me and were on my side. So and, and from the day on, there was, it was just uh, fighting and 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 
well, most days I would just go with the local group there and we're drinking. And um, after a year, about a year, uh, one of the skinheads were like, um, have you ever been with the NPD? And the NPD is a National Democratic Party of Germany, and it sounds harmless, but there's nothing democratic about it. Uh, they're technically neo-Nazis, just hiding their, their, uh, a lot of their beliefs. Well, actually not. They, they, ju they just uh, kind of legalize it. And, you know, Germany has pretty tough hate speech laws, but it depends how you say things, you know, you can... Bend and twist. Right. So they, they twist it good enough that you, you know they're neo-Nazis, but you can't do anything about it because they don't say what they're not allowed to say. And I was like, first, I don't want to go there. It's probably just neo-Nazis or old guys with, with suit and ties. I don't want that. No, no, there's a couple of skinheads there. And I was like, so, okay. So I went there and all young people and got along with them. And that's where politics came came in. And I learned more about really World War II other than what I learned in school. And it felt like a little bit of, of knowledge that other people don't know the stuff. Why don't they tell me this in school that, like, they told me that Germany actually did not start World War II. They told me that Germany defended itself, that they were pushed into World War II. Oh, okay. So my grandparents were actually not criminals. They were actually heroes, right? Feels much better, too, because... You have to realize, I was born in 1975, 30 years after the liberation of Auschwitz. And a lot of the grandparents were still alive, at least the grandmothers. And learning about the Holocaust and about the atrocities and seeing these pictures and these movies and everything. No, I wasn't a Holocaust denier at that point yet. So you know the Holocaust happened, that all this stuff happened, and your grandparents were around. You ask yourself, what did they do? Were they involved? I don't know. You don't ask these questions. Mm. These are people you love, you know. You don't want to see them as criminals, so you, you push that away and don't ask questions. But all of a sudden you hear, hey, they defended the, the, the fatherland, you know. They were heroes. Oh, that's cool, you know. That dilemma was gone, and that that felt great, and um, and of course anti-Semitism started coming up more and more, and it was different from the jokes that I, that I used to tell when I was fifteen. You know, um, I didn't really know why that anti-Semitism was there. Okay, wow, well, what what about the Jews? I don't know any. Unfortunately, Germany doesn't have a big Jewish community anymore, and. Uh, so I was like, I don't know any of them. I saw a couple of pictures of a couple of Jews uh, uh, at the temple in Jerusalem with a black hat and, and locks and everything. That's how Jews looked for me, and I don't know any. What's so bad about them? I knew Hitler killed them, so they must be bad, period. I didn't know why. Um, but you see, there was a shift from the kid that just very unintentionally did anti-Semitic things, racist things, not falling uh, the attention to hate, was the intention to get attention, you know? Shifted to the skinhead that provoked and get attention there, and then shifted to become a nationalist. That's when it become, became more serious. And that's also about the time when I started actually grabbing a guitar and making music. And I told you I was always interested in music, you know, like my sister's music, the loud music and heavy metal and, and, and glam rock and electric guitars. And I remember our neighbors had a, had a guitar that I got at some point. My sister also played guitar, but nobody could really teach me anything. Um, because, again, I thought nobody cares. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to write more short stories or draw comics or play the guitar, and I just couldn't do it. But all of a sudden, I was like in, in my early 20s, and uh, I grabbed the guitar again, and all these short stories or lyrics, I wrote poems sometimes, made them into songs. And all of a sudden, there were people who wanted to hear it. 
and so I started recording songs. And what was that like then when you're recording songs? How was the the kind of rage there and who were you hating against back then? Well, everybody who was different. Everybody, everybody except the Germ Germans? At that time, mostly. Mostly anybody who was not white, anybody who was not German, who was not Aryan, um, pretty much anybody who was not straight, anybody who was Muslim, who was not... I didn't care much about religion. I didn't grow up in a religious household. I was baptized Catholic. I went to church uh, on Christmas, <laughs> and that's it. So I, I didn't really care. But it was you had it in the head of uh, in the back of your head that people said, "Oh, the Muslims are coming and taking over," and uh, I didn't know what that meant in in, in the late nineteen eighties or nineteen nineties. But I was afraid. I was afraid it was going to happen, even though I didn't know how it would look like or why it was a bad thing or why it was a bad thing if Germans would become the minority or these are all things that I've been told. In 2020 or 2050, Germans will be the, min or the minority in certain cities. And I was like, oh, my God, that's bad. You know, it was uh, a lot of hate, uh, um, fear-based propaganda. And, well, what you don't know, you start to hate it, you know. And especially when it dehumanize. And um, this is uh, how those groups do it. We start dehumanizing. You don't call them humans or people. They're rats. They're ticks. Like we all always call the, the, the punks and the, the left wings, they were ticks in German. Because you could just smash them. It's, it's, they're, not, they're not even human beings. And if you don't see something as a human being, it's just easier to hurt them. You take their humanity away. At the same time, you take your own humanity away too. So what is a neo-Nazi? For people who don't know. Well, yeah, the old Nazis in the Third Reich, and they were hung in 1946, at least the leaders. That's what I always thought. I wasn't aware how many Nazis actually were still around in Germany. They were just either hiding it or just saying it when you don't pay attention or when you thought it's just a joke. Like people would say, man, all these, all these foreigners and everything... Actually, we, we, we would need a Hitler again, just a, just a small Hitler. Not, not as bad as Hitler was, but a small one, you know? You wouldn't think anything about it. So these were the old Nazis that were around in like 1940 until 45. But the neo-Nazis are the new Nazis, and they existed ever, ever since, trying either to revive the Third Reich or do whatever. And you, you said, that, like, what was the purpose of the skinheads, you know? And what was the purpose? Just acting up, just getting drunk, just like the punks. What's the purpose of rebelling against society? That was mostly what it was about. And a little bit like like the brown shirts that Hitler had, you know, the Sturm of Thailand. What was their purpose? They were in the beer brawls, you know, they were out there on the streets fighting until until they got rid of them. It's a little bit like that with the skinheads. And the neo Nazis thought they have the political solutions and they can take over at some point and I guess some groups, depends what group it was some groups had the vision of install a fourth Reich, a copy of the third Reich for some groups it would look completely different, for some groups it would be just a direct continued continuation of the third Reich some groups had no idea, they just were dreaming of day X and uh, some groups call it also Day of the Sword, because of the Day of the Sword, this is when you would start violence, you would kill the traitors, you would the traitors in your group, the traitors in the government, everybody that you want to get rid of, the Jews, the communists, everybody, and you take over the Day of the Revolution. And a lot of the groups had no idea how it would look like once you get there, because most of these groups, fortunately, would be completely incapable of running a government or taking over, fortunately. When did the, when did the Nazis start? What year? The, the real Nazis? Yeah. Um, technically, they've always been around, but it was like um, in the 19, early 1920s, they had actually groups like the Ostara Society and the, the Thule Society, and when Hitler actually came from Austria, he was 
one many people forget that he wasn't he wasn't really German. He was he was Austrian. So you see, the Germans don't really want to own the guy, <laughs> um, but they voted for him. Uh, when he went in World War One, he fought for the Germans, and um, and he stayed then in in Munich because he he tried to actually be a painter, and the university kicked him out. They didn't want him. So he went to Munich, and that's when he hung around with a couple people of the Thule Society who were promoting a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda, including the early 20s, um, the, the myth that it's the Jews' fault that, that Germany lost World War I and that they have to pay all these reparations and so on. They had to pay a lot of money after World War I. And Germans are completely devastated. They didn't know what was going on. And they blamed the Jews for it. And that's where Hitler started to prosper and rise to power. Because he unfortunately was a very good speaker and everything. And so he was used by, by these people that were already in the Nazi party. He didn't start the whole thing. That already was there. How many Germans died and was? And there was? Uh, to be honest, I, I don't know the numbers anymore. I used to know them. But you had a lot of soldiers that died. Um, you had a lot of civilians that died. You had a lot of um, Americans and the British. They bombed a couple of cities where a lot of civilians died. We always used it, of course, against the British or the Americans. Look, they were much worse than the Germans. But um, the Britons invaded over ninety percent of the world. Britain are fucking ruthless. <laughs> they are ruthless. For me, all wars murder, and I'm only saying that from the outside. But people are so easily manipulated. Could there be another war? Possibly. You get Russia and Ukraine. Like I say, I'm not intelligent enough and I have enough information what's going on, but I watched Putin do an interview and he was talking about NATO coming closer. He did warn that he wanted a peace. He was they were going to sign a peace agreement and America says no, but then you've got the media who portray him as a bad guy. Like I say, I don't care for people in government. I, I genuinely don't care. I concentrate on me and my life. Um and understand when you talk about fear, fear is what controls the world. If you're Absolutely. full of fear, Absolutely. you'll be manipulated into do anything and accepting it. Same as Iraq, no weapons of mass destruction. Over a million Iraq Iraqis died. People got to question everything. Like I said, with Germany and the wars, and when you've been taught at school, you've been taught to hate, you've been brainwashed to hate others who are not German. And everybody has got choices, but people can be programmed and conditioned in so many ways that they're, they're so dumbed down that they don't even understand that. But that's that's exactly what happened. You say people can be programmed, and that's what happened with the music. You see, there was the, just a kid in a box, like like I said. Nobody looked at the human being in the box anymore. They just looked at the label. It's a Nazi kid. And from that point, I I was de deprogrammed or wired. Complete, completely wired to be to be something else, um, um, and that's what our what our brains do, you know, neurons and everything. The brain is forming neuron path, neural pathways, yeah, neurons in the brain and you form habits. Yeah, fire together, wire and what together. you hear over and over and over again, you know, you you learn to love what you just see every day. That's a famous quote from Silence of the Lambs. You know, mm -hmm. it's 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 the same thing. You start to to like what you see and hear every day if it makes sense or not. And it's it's like your trusted source. Like if your parents, like you grow up around your parents and I, I trusted my mother. I, again, I never thought she doesn't love me and I never thought she would lie to me. Why, why would she? I trusted her. So she's my trusted source. And, and if she started, in this case, starting telling me some, pardon my French bullshit, you know, let's say some ideology, which fortunately did not happen. That's not, that's not where it came from. But I know people that were indoctrinated by the parents, you know? Why would your parents lie to you? So they always said the truth. So the next thing you're telling must be the truth too. That's how, also how all these QAnon people here in the US came to be. Because they started telling a little bit that resonated, that was true. So you trust them. And then they feed you with a little bit more and you trust them because it's also true. And then you start coming up with the stuff that's not true. And you, you start believing it. You start believing every word they say. Because it's slow. Radicaliz radicalization is always happening slow. 
for some time, you know, af after I got out of the, of the hate movement, movement, I always thought, how did my mother not see what was happening? Because I imagine myself how it happened. I came home at some point. I came home with a bald head. Um, I had like I looked more. I dressed like imagine Miami Vice and Don Johnson. You know, that's a little bit how I looked like. You know, <laughs> and the next day I came home with a bald head, bomber jacket, and boots on, you know? And my mom must have thought I'm out of my mind. I mean, she was like, oh, my God, what happened? I said, oh, it's just hair. It'll grow again. Well, I cut it again when it grew. But my mom was not as shocked because it, it happened gradually. The bald head, yeah, that happened overnight. But my behavior didn't happen overnight. It happened slowly. When I did, radicalized slowly. When did it consume you? When did it become 100% of you and that life and hate and rage? How long did it take for you to be truly brainwashed to believe in everything that says and done? I believe a little bit after I started making music, um, which I was in my early 20s. I uh, was involved in the stuff for about six, seven years already. And if you write those lyrics... It's your own stuff. It's different than singing it or just copying or, or uh, sing along, you know, because it's not your stuff. You just get drunk and you, you yell what they yell, you know, or you yell slogans what the others yell, or you read what, but if you start writing this stuff yourself, that's, that's your stuff. And then at the beginning, we often wrote stuff that we didn't believe in because imagine we finally were somebody. We, we could be little rock stars and, to be honest, it feels great. Of course, you're on a stage and they cheer to you and, and they sing your lyrics. And we, of course, copied or covered songs of other bands that were notorious, you know, that had really the most radical lyrics just because we knew that's what the crowd wants to hear. So we're singing that, even though I didn't believe in half of it, what, what they were singing. Sometimes uh, see, these bands are also writing something just because the crowd wants to hear it. But at some point, you start to believe your own stuff, you know? You start starting to believe what you're writing there. So it's very unintentional, with a different intent, you know? You're writing with a different intent. And after a while, you, you just start believing it, and you don't question it anymore. That was in the mid-'90s. I started recording uh, albums. I, 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 I toured, and um, I was still a skinhead, and at the same time, but also a member of that, of that political party. Um, I was like 97, 98. And then a uh, couple things happened that radicalized me even more. What? Uh, one thing was the internet. I call it the advent of the internet. 1997, 1998. All of a sudden, everybody had a computer with a modem. You no know, sound like a fax machine, and nobody could pick up the phone anymore because you blocked everything. Uh, it took you like 20 minutes to download something, but it was still faster than to order something and smuggle it into the country. Um, there was two things that changed drastically with the internet. One thing was you could get in touch with people from all over the world in chat rooms. And at that time, I already knew people from, from other European countries uh, um, because those skinheads travel, they want to listen to, to, to the bands from other countries. So we had a lot of people that came from Great Britain, from Italy, from France, and so on. But you, you only saw them so and so often, and mostly at a concert where you got drunk and you didn't talk much really about politics or anything or anything with a deeper background, you know. But in those chat rooms, well, you're, you're sitting in your living room with a computer and you have time to talk. So, so you talk about all kinds of stuff. And I met people from all over the world. And up to that point, I was the nationalist who thought Germany's under attack. We have to defend ourselves. It's the Muslim coming, Muslims coming in. The communists are trying to take over, and so on and so on. And all of a sudden, I had people from all over the world told me the same story. Oh, man, the communists are trying to take over, and they're flooding us with with all this abnormal stuff, abnormal music, abnormal art, abnormal uh, uh, TV and, and Hollywood and, and all this stuff. And I heard it from everywhere. And I was like, no, it's not Germany under attack. It's the white race that's under attack. Like, oh, wow. That changed something. 
And so, but an attack by whom? By whom? Well, it's not the black. The black people are just pawns, just like us. We don't want to mix with them, but it's it's they're not doing it by themselves. They're not that smart. That's what they told me. Um, there's one book that they told me to read, and you have to see. Until that point, it was extremely hard to get your hands on cer certain literature in Germany because Germany has learned from the Holocaust. They banned a lot of the literature. You would go to prison if you deny the Holocaust, and so on and so on and so on. So you had to smuggle it into the country. And there was a mail order from the U.S. that smuggled it in. And it was, well, sometimes it worked, sometimes it, it didn't. If the post office didn't, or the customs didn't keep it. And a mail order from Scandinavia. And they, they brought in most of it. Really, really bad stuff. But it took, it took a while until either somebody physically brought it in, but with the internet, one mouse click. And you had it on the computer. And the book they told me to read was uh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is, now I know that, it's a pamphlet that was made up in Russia in, in, in the early 1900s to dis discredit Jews. They made it look like it's it's a meeting of the, of the Jewish World Congress where they talk about how to take over the world, the blueprint of how the Jews are taking over the world. I was like, Wow, this is why Hitler didn't like them. The Nazis knew about this. This is why they wanted to get rid of them. So the Jews are the enemy. They are they are causing all this. They're behind the banks, they're behind the media. Just look at at a Hollywood movie. One guy always said, watch a Hollywood movie and watch watch the names at the end of a Hollywood movie. It, it reads like the phone book of Tel Aviv. And yes, you had a lot of Jews in Hollywood. You still do. But we use that as a proof they're controlling everything. And all of a sudden, if I felt like my grandparents, you know, knowing or thinking they were defending Germany, they were the heroes. Well, I have to defend my country. I have to defend my, my race. I have to defend actually everybody from that big enemy, you know? I can be a superhero, actually. Like, in which young man doesn't want to be a superhero, especially nowadays? Everybody. I said, yeah, give me that cape. Of course, I want to be that hero who can save everybody, who can save my people from the Jews. And that's, I really was convinced of that. So I became a white supremacist and a really hardcore anti-Semite that changed, especially in the year 1998. And I incorporated that into my music, into politics. Um, the NPD that I was a member of, they were uh, not hardcore enough for me. Um, I got approached by a KKK group. This is when that happened in Germany. And yes, they exist. They also exist in many other European countries. Fortunately, very, very small. And... Um, was actually a group of, of people that followed me to my concerts. I did a lot of acoustic gigs, and they came to a couple. And I knew that they were in the clan, um, but I didn't know I didn't know much about it. It was for a long time. I didn't want to have anything to do with it because um, I didn't know how real it is. And um, I hear heard a couple of bands singing about it, and uh, you know there were movies like Mississippi Burning where you can see them black beating up like people or lynching people. I said, well, this is stupid. This is this is not how we solve this problem. We need to take over the government. We we need to really do this in a big scheme, not just take people in the streets and beat them up, you know? This is what I was convinced what we had to do. You know, I personally only committed the violence when I was with the skinheads, the street gang, when we fought the Turks or whatever, or... Uh, uh, in these instances, as soon as I got higher up in the ranks, and as a musician also in, in, in the party, um, or as a neo-Nazi, I was like, I'm not making my hands dirty, because it's, it, it doesn't do much. So I was also convinced we all, either we will end up dead or in prison. Uh, well, I'm not good dead. Uh, in prison... I've never been to prison. We were like in, in uh, 
when we're drunk, they caught us often, put us in a cell, and we could go the next day. And one time we uh, had an illegal march without a permit, and that's when they brought us to a real prison over the weekend. I guess they just wanted to mess with us. Maybe they didn't have enough room at their police department. I don't know, but they brought us to a real prison. We had to spend the weekend there, and that was that was that was weird. And I was like, shit, no. That gave me a taste of that, and I was like, I don't want to go to prison because at the time I already had three kids. And I was like, if I'm in prison, I'm not any good for my kids. Uh, I'm doing a disservice to my country, actually, because I can't do anything from prison. And I felt like it's a very scary place. <laughs> I was just afraid to go to prison. So I was like, we, we have to reach our goals another way, either like Hitler did it. He he, he was voted because he, he did it. He, he tried a coup and they sent him to prison. A lot of people forget about this. this is, just look at the U.S., how, how things sometimes repeat itself, you know, when people started storming the capital, you know. That's what Hitler tried. They had in the, in the 1920s, they had a march in Munich and tried to take over the government. They were stopped and he was uh, convicted and he spent one and a half years in prison. That's why he wrote Mein Kampf. And then he realized, okay, this is not the way. Mm -hmm. And he realized, well, he has to run for office. And it worked. And that's what we thought, too. We A coup will not work. The day of the revolution, we didn't think that will happen. I, I was that aware already that I was like these, these fantasies of those skinheads or neo-Nazis. Oh, we are taking over and the day X and the revolution and we will just take over and execute all our enemies. It's not happening. See the skinheads, the neo-Nazis, the KKK, is it all under the same umbrella or is there different levels to them? No, it's the skinheads from the age just like, was it the skinheads and the mods back in the day, Steph? Yeah, they kind of, there was nothing to them. It was their fights and their partying. But who was the most extreme? It went extreme in case of violence hate. or in, in hate. I, I think it's a matter of intent. Because you seem more political of like a chess player, very calculated towards... It be I became that way on the way how how radicalized myself, or how I was radicalized, but I also radicalized myself because I was the violent skin at first. The almost innocent schoolboy who picked all this up and, and unintentionally did all these anti-Semitic and, and racist things, you know, but just for the sake of attention, not for the sake of hating. I, did, I, didn't, I didn't want to hate. I actually wanted to be liked, you know. I felt liked, actually, when, when kids came and wanted to hear those jokes. I felt liked. They liked me for that. When they saw the comic that I drew with all these Holocaust jokes and everything, I felt liked because they liked me. They liked it. I didn't want to be hated. I didn't want to hate either. That came later. So it's all about intent. The skinheads, the hate they have, for the most part, it's it's like like you have a lot of unpolitical skinheads. They still exist. They're not, they're not haters, you know. They're they just want to have fun, you know. They go, they listen to music, they go dance and and women and whatever and, and get drunk, and and they're, they're more like him. Violent hippies, maybe, <laughs> but you know what I mean. That's not that's not for for the for the sake of hate. But the the racist skinheads clash with all these gangs and whatever, and hate they hate them for a different reason. And then you have the the nationalists. Um, they say they don't hate; they just dislike. Or it's very often all these people say they don't hate anybody. It's it's like. Um, a lot of American groups came up with that. It's heritage, not hate. We just love our own people. We do not hate anybody. Just leave me alone, and then I don't have a problem with you. Like, if you go, take your immigrants home. If you take you take black people home, and it's just us Germans or Great Britain, just the Brits or just the white Americans, then we don't have a problem with you. So you always defended yourself and, and said, oh, we actually just love our people. 
I, yeah, that's nothing wrong with it, you know? And uh, so you actually tell yourself, whenever you have doubts, you know, whenever you hear that the music, whatever, and hate music, or uh, you people using the N-word, or other words for, discrediting words for um, what, immigrants and whatever, and especially if you're not that radicalized yet, you're still more receptive to the other side, you know? And you're like, I don't know about this group. They're saying all these things. They listen to listen to this music. That's the propaganda. But they're saying, yeah, that's, that's a little harsh. Yes, we know. But actually, we only love our own people. And if they just would go away, we wouldn't. They make us do this. And that, with the skinheads, it was the same thing. Sometimes we went to town with our whole outfit, you know, and we knew the parts where the Turkish gangs were. And we'd just walk through, and we knew they would come attack us. And then we would fight back. So we could say, look how they behave in our country. We didn't do anything. They attacked us. We just defend ourselves. Justifying. Justifying, yeah. And it's the same with with things like the N-word or... or uh, uh, other things you would say or what you would do. It's like, no, I'm actually not like that, but they make me feel like this. If they just would go away, I'm I'm fine. I'm not a hater. I just love my own people, but they make me do this. What about left, the left wing? Would they, and if they were German, how was it hatred for left wing as well? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because it's like um, there were the communists and Hitler hated the communists. The communists hated Germany. Um... They were not patriots, and therefore they were one of the sworn in enemies, of course. What were you told? What were you taught f from the world wars? What were you taught from Hitler's movement? Like when, at when I when I was yeah. in school, when I was in school, we learned that it, that Hitler started the war, that the Nazis started the war. We learned the Nazis were the bad guys. We learned that the Holocaust happened. And so that it must never happen again. So, so we learned about these things. Germans are very well aware of that. It, it took a while, you know. But how do we know what uh, even uh, is the truth anymore? Because for me, looking at the outside, all the people in wars, there's companies who fund both sides of wars now, is the people pulling the strings behind that, the greedy men in suits who are then getting young boys to fight in wars that don't need to fight in. For me, the people in suits should be going fighting. If they've got issues and problems, go and fight your fucking I mean, self. Yeah, it wasn't in, in, in Germany with World War II the same. I mean, the people that were in charge, they, they weren't the people going out fighting, you know. Mm -hmm. When Germany already had lost the war, pretty much, the Russians were already in Berlin, you know. They still convinced young people, 10, 11, 12-year-old boys to grab weapons and go out there and fight the Russians mm -hmm. that were already in Berlin. And those kids did it because they grew up in this environment. They didn't know anything else. This was just their environment, and they had to defend their country, their Führer, you know. That's, they were completely indoctrinated. They didn't even have to be radicalized, because that's how they grew up. And this is um, where, after World War II, you know, Germany was, was divided in four parts. Mm -hmm. You had the Russians, had the East, and then you had the West. The, 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 the Brits, the, Fran the French, and Americans had the West, also cut into three pieces, you know? So, and, and the Allies, and the Allies ha had the problem, what, what are we going to do with Germany after World War II, you know? Not all the Nazis are dead. The soldiers that were out, a lot of them were dead. A lot of the leaders committed suicide or were, were hung in Nuremberg. A lot of scientists, well, the Russians cut them, or the U.S. cut them. Look at Werner von Braun, became NASA director, you know? So, all the scientists were used... Um, and then you had the regular population, you know, that was that was left, that was indoctrinated as well, that either grew up under Hitler or was radicalized under Hitler. You you can't kill all of them, you know. Well, what, what are you gonna do with all these Nazis? You know, that's why everything was banned to start with. When my mom was in school, she was born in 1945, and she told me. They learned in school that World War II started in 1939 and ended in 1945. And that's it. Period. Um, they heard the stories, but it was just forbidden to talk about it. It was bad. You don't do this anymore. If you do it, you go to prison. Period. You had 
technically to wait until the real Nazis, the old Nazis, died. And the next generation, which was me and my siblings, and my mom was already also the next generation, but they were indoctrinated. So my siblings and I were the generation done in the 70s, 80s, that you could actually really educate what happened, you know? So um, in the 1980s, 1990s, most of the Germans didn't want any Nazis. They knew Hitler brought nothing but doom and destruction. Um, none of them had really a problem with, with Jews or with, with immigrants or what, whatsoever. Um, so Jews were taught to then hate Hitler? Were Jews taught to hate? Yeah. Why? I mean, he 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 brought nothing but doom and destruction. So is the fucking UK. They're still causing yeah, doom but and the Germans they they're very aware of what just happened, and and the guy was just a, it it was just a no go period. And but you you couldn't talk you couldn't talk about it really. You couldn't even make fun of it. And and the funny part is the funny part the person who broke that side it was a Jewish director. I believe it was uh, uh, Daniel Cohn. I would have to look it up. He made a film about Hitler where they made fun of Hitler. Mm -hmm. So it was a Jewish director. Because, of course, as, as a Jew, you would be allowed to make jokes about Hitler while the regular German was like, we can't touch this topic. This is this is a little bit too much, you know? And it was much, much easier to to reflect on the topic, you know? So the, the regular germ didn't want any neo-Nazis. The regular germ didn't want any skinheads. They didn't want a KKK. They just wanted these people to go away as well. Yeah. So the regular germ was also our enemy. Said e either you're on our side or you're on, on their side. So who the fuck are you fighting against then? Who are you Everybody, the whole yeah, world. That's what I'm saying. The whole world, it was, it was, it was exhausting. You were waking up, you know. And and hating everybody and, and fighting the whole world. It's like it's like you were like felt like you're the elite group that had the secret knowledge that nobody has. And we can fix the world. We know how to do it. We will take over the small group. And how was that obviously with Britain and America? Because there's a lot of right wing extremists in these countries. So how was that when there's a sort of partnership between Germany UK, America, when people were in the KKK, and oh yeah, we, so we how, always had it. We always were in touch with these groups. But how, why, if they were the enemy, also at one point, or just because they had the same beliefs as yours that they were yeah, accepted, and we had we had the same enemy at that time. I believed that there's a Jewish world consp uh, conspiracy. Okay, the Jews are taking over the world. They have taken over the world. We have to. Or they're about to take really over, and the only thing that stands between the Jews and world domination is the white race. And this is why the Jews are trying to take the white race down. This is why they're promoting race mixing. That's why they're trying to bring Christianity down, bring all these Muslims into Europe, and flood Europe just to make the white race weaker, to mix them up. So that's just a mixed race who can defend themselves anymore, that has no own culture. That's what they're trying to do, and we are the only ones who are standing in between them and world domination. So we have to team up with all the white people worldwide. The stuff you're saying now, people still say now. The stuff that you're saying and the stuff that you believe, does people still have those same conversations? Nothing fucking changes. No, they, See what they, you're they saying? Still, people still going on about immigrants, they're still going on about wars, they're still going on about right wing, left wing, it's never ending fighting. No, it's, it's never ending because the thing is Do you is see like, that as well? Yeah, you, you're because the, the problem is that we're always afraid that something is taken away from us, you know? And and I think that's a normal human but the emotion. Jew, the Jews are white though. The Jews are white, no? The Jews? It's yeah. Just, yeah. So why would they want to take away whites if you know what I mean so the Jewish people are majority yeah, we, are right yeah well we, we, we thought of them as um, the, the Jews are actually an ethno-religious group oh, they, I don't know that's why I ask I don't know and um, they, 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 you, you have a lot of you have, you have black Jews from, from Ethiopia mm -hmm. um, they just now in the last 20-30 years came into Israel for example 
you have Jewish communities in India and China and, and everywhere. Um, and then you have different, like um, a lot of Israeli Jews and Jews that stayed, that stayed in the in the area of, of the state of Israel for the last 2,000 years. And then you had other tribes, they came into Eastern Europe and then into Europe, so so the, they call them Ashkenazi. And then you have tribes that stayed in North Africa that came in, into Spain and they're Sephardic Jews. So you can see different racial differences there. So a lot of Jews are not white. Um, but that's that's not the issue. That's not how Jews identify themselves. You know, it's not about race. It's There are people there. It's ethno-religious. Um, but uh, 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 we always said because of that, the Jews are actually even worse because they would mix up. They have no own identity, you know? And um, while the white people would try to keep their their race clean and, and their heritage and whatever, while the Jews, they don't, and uh, uh, that's the only way how to, how to win, mm -hmm. to take uh, the integrity of white people away and to mix them up too so they can't stand up against them anymore. That's what we believed in at the time. How many albums did you write? Oh, five or six. What was the names of them? Uh, you don't, I don't need to promote it here. <laughs> that shit is unfortunately still out there. You can, you can even buy it. Some you know, neo-Nazis don't care about copyrights. I, I could sue them. It wouldn't help. They would still put it out there, um, which was just put attention on, on, those, on those songs, and I don't want to do that. Uh, you can buy them. You can download them. They're on YouTube. They're they're freaking everywhere. And this is one of the big regrets that I have. That this stuff is still out there, and I can't do anything about it. Things I've written, lyrics, essays, and so on, that are promoted, that is still out there. This and a couple of people that I groomed that are now in leading positions that are still out there, like monsters that I created, and nothing I can do about. It. I can do something about what I did wrong. I can do about something about damage that I have done, and I can do things to, to make it better, to make up for it, because I have to, because I want to, and because it's just the right thing to do. These things that I can't change, it hurts. Because it hurts, and it's, it's not cool. Because the music you listened to groomed you and conditioned you and programmed you for oh. your certain beliefs, so now that you've obviously made changes trying to clean the heart and do the right things. People are listening to your music to this day Still. and then following that kind of path that you went down. Yeah, and that's 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 what's bothering me. Uh, on on the other hand, it's, it's mostly people uh, of minority groups who tell me, say, TM, stop beating yourself up over this. You've done so, so many good things now. Stop bothering about this, you know, but it's hard because I know it's out there, you know, and that's, that's a guilt that I can never get rid of, you know, and there's a lot out there. When, when I joined the KKK, it was not about violence either. We did, um, it was the same thing. I saw, I saw it as a secret organization, a secret brotherhood that has influence. Because then I started to, again, the internet was all around at the time, started to look it up. And in the U.S. in the 1920s, in certain states like Indiana, for example, the governor was, was in the clan. It was the Grand Dragon there. And uh, there was, in politics, you couldn't get around the clan at the time. You know, it, it, was, it was crazy that six, seven million members. It was like on, in, in Washington. On Pennsylvania Avenue, you had 10,000 of Klansmen with their white hoods and everything marching there in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, oh, they were, re that, they were really in charge, you know? I thought, this is, this is how we have to do it. Not with violence, not with the day X, not with the revolution, not even trying to get in there as a political party and get voted because Germans are so much smarter for the most part. <laughs> And at least if it's real Nazis or real radicals that they say, no, we don't want them to be in charge. We don't vote for you guys, you know? But if we infiltrate society with our people, then it doesn't matter what party they're in, you know? If we put key people, our people in key positions, cops, 
judges in political parties that run for office, then we can have them in five different parties. You know what I mean? Then it doesn't matter which party is in charge because we have our people everywhere. And this is what I wanted to do then. And um, unfortunately, we re recruited really, really good. We really managed to have police officers as members, uh, business people. It was a small group. Um, the first year we were just busy. Like when I was recruited, I was in, in one group that I left after about two years. And then I started an old group with a, um, I was encouraged by a group from America, from Mississippi, this, or like, you need to start your own group with this concept. You need to build this up. We're going to help you and so on. So I started that group. And the first year we were just busy writing the whole doctrine, writing, uh, maybe, website and and print material and uh i had like overhead projectors at home so so we could really have classes and everything i had a copy machine at home uh we printed our own magazine at home you know and, and send it out um we had about a couple of hundred supporters because they didn't want them as members was like yeah you can send out your money in <laughs> but you know the people that they emailed us. Yeah, I, I would do lynch like people and call them the N word and whatever. For the most part, we didn't even reply to these emails because that was the same things. Then we have skinheads and bed sheets. You know, doesn't lead anywhere. But you can send us your money, and I will send you. You can be a supporter, and you can get a certificate. I don't care, and a magazine, uh, but uh, not as a member. And so we had a, a, a within two years um, a, a small group of people small it was, it was only 25 people but we had so many applications um we we teamed up um we took over a whole uh group from sweden that joined our group because they liked the concept from austria we had a realm in in france one in belgium um we had actually uh a couple of people from ireland that wanted to join and um, I even started writing speeches and everything for the one leader in Mississippi because I came up with all these concepts and everything. So I started helping them with their stuff. Um, and again, we really managed it to, to, to have police officers. And I thought we're safe because there was a shift about the year 2000s. So I, you... I radicalized from 1998 to 2000. I radicalized. It exploded. My music, then, then being in the, that first KKK group, um, splitting off from that NPD because they wanted radical enough and they didn't like that I was in a Christian group because most German neo Nazis are uh, anti Christian. And um, in 2000, I had a shift where. Um, I, I almost went to prison. Actually, I had again. Germany has very harsh um, hate crime lyrics, uh, hate, hate hate crime laws, and every time we wrote lyrics for our music, we would have a lawyer look over it, so we don't get in trouble. Um, at least when we published it in Germany, when we published it somewhere else, we didn't do that because we couldn't get in trouble if you put it out in Denmark, because we didn't break any law there. If somebody smuggles that stuff into Germany, you can't do anything. So I got I got in trouble because of that. That was a mistake, and I thought I could get, get out of it, and I couldn't. And the government already wanted to get rid of me, and they were like, okay. Um, they pushed they pushed me in, into the corner and said, okay, if you don't change anything, you're going to prison. I was like, shit, no. I'm like, and I was thinking about that. Again, either I will end up dead or in prison. And I didn't want either, so I decided, okay, I'm I'm really cutting any contact to the skinheads and the neo Nazis. You think, hey, that's a great thing, right? <laughs> no, because I still had that clan group that I just opened. I was like, I don't need the skinheads. I don't need the Nazis. I have a secret society. I have a secret brotherhood that I can use, so the cops don't bother me anymore. I just keep the whole thing secret, and we start infiltrating society. Everything will be fine. Yeah, of course not. Um, we were watched from day one. They infiltrated the group. We had one guy who worked for the uh, intelligence service. Um, he came to meetings uh, with a bug in, in his backpack and, and, and filming stuff and whatever. 
And of course, they found out that we had police officers as members and whatever, so they, they completely freaked out. Police officers as members of a KKK group in Germany in 2002. This is freaking insane. If, if that becomes public, there's a real scandal out there. So they tried really everything to push me out of the position, out of the leadership position, because they knew if they get rid of me from the top of that organization, that the organization will just crumble away. And um, which, which, which they could um, actually, there was one key moment actually that made me think, and I realized we were, um, we were monitored, then we were investigated, and that we had a spy at the time. I didn't know who it was. And the uh, intelligence server visited us. Actually, all of the members, we had a big rally, and all the members that visited uh, were uh, attending the rally were visited by the intelligence service. And um, we came out to my house, and they were like, yeah, you know we're watching you. I said, well, now I know. So what are you going to do? We're not doing anything illegal. Well, no, but, you know, what if one of your members is committing a hate crime? What about that? And I was convinced, hey, we're getting cops, we're getting whatever. But uh, so you know, if one of them is committing a violent crime, it's your head that's on the plate, right? I was like, nah, my members are not doing anything. I brushed it off. Uh, they left. And it gave me time to think. A lot of other things happened, too, that gave me time to think. And there was just a, a moment where I was like, man, this is insane. Actually, I don't know what these members are doing, you know? At the end, we're promoting a hateful message. We're promoting, actually, hate. And uh, I think the only reason why we didn't promote violence is because we would have been in prison, you know? So I wasn't really sure that none of the members would go out and commit some violent crime. It's it's the clan after all. If it's a KKK, you know? You you just just have one of them watch Mississippi burning and then takes out or something, you know? And I was like, Yep, I will go to prison. And I was just a point where I was like, okay, I can't do this anymore. Um just the sheer fear to go to prison pushed me so much in the corner. I said, I, I need to stop all activities. I can't do this anymore. I was also so tired from hating. From, like you said, we hated everybody. Yes, we hated everybody. <laughs> like, you, you wake up, you're like crazy. <laughs> that, that was, it was so bad that, that uh, uh, during the time, um, I was so paranoid that I took my computer and my mom lived right next door in the house. And that she, there was a staircase. And I would hide the computer under the staircase and then, well, in the morning, like at 2 a.m. And I knew if the cops come and kick in my door to confiscate stuff and raid my house, you know, they would come in like at 6 or 7 o'clock. So and I would sleep until 10. And I knew, okay, I'm safe. The cops are not coming anymore. Got my computer back, <laughs> did my stuff, you know, and at night I would hide it again. So that's how paranoid I was, you know. You're waking up and you're like, oh, my God, the race war is starting. Or the Jews are taking over the world or whatever. It's like crazy. It's like exhausting. And I just was too exhausted. I couldn't do it anymore. I didn't want to do it anymore. But I was still a hater. The beliefs were still there. It was just uh, uh, I didn't know what to do with it. And for a while, I was still hanging around with a couple of members of the group because that's all I had. That's all I had for the last like fifteen years, you know. That's I didn't know any normal people, and I was like, man, I already stepped back from my duties. I even left the group officially. I said, I'm gone. I'm not coming back. And I told them, you hold uh, an election next year in spring. You you will you will vote a new leader. I'm not coming back. I was still hanging out with them. I was like, oh, if something happens, and I ha I'm hanging out with them. Then they might think I'm still pulling the strings, you know, uh, just not officially. No, I, we, we have to go back. And then me and my ex-wife and the, and the kids decided to move into another town where I knew where no neo-Nazis were. And um, the lease was about to be uh, 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 over. So we had, we, had, we had to move out anyway. And the only apartment we could find was owned by a Turkish immigrant. 
I was like, really, I remember when I picked up the phone, when he picked up the phone and you could hear the accent, you know, I was like, oh, come on, really? Really? <laughs> Only one apartment that we could find, you know? I was like, hey, I don't need to marry the guy, you know? So he moved there and um, moved in. He lived downstairs. We lived upstairs, uh, just two apartments. And um, so I really, really cut ties with an old group. I didn't talk to them anymore. And I was like, I need, but just to protect myself because I didn't want to prison. That was the only reason. That was the only reason why I did this. And I uh, moved in. And it was so absurd how this happened. I didn't, I tried to avoid any contact with the Turkish guy, with my landlord, because I didn't want to any, have anything to do with him. It was in 2002, a year after 9 11. So, all Muslims are like Osama bin Laden and want to kill me in my bed at night, you know. So he's probably coming upstairs and stabs me at some point or something. I don't know what I thought. I was like, so I don't want it. He's bad. He must be a terrorist. He's probably going to mosque and that's where they planned out, all that stuff, you know. And uh, he, he, he seemed to be a nice guy. He was good hiding his stuff, you know. <laughs> And uh, uh, he asked me if we can help him. He had computer problems, whatever. And I was like, whatever. And I just, so I helped him a couple of times and uh, he paid me at the beginning. So I went downstairs, helped him. He paid me back upstairs. It was, it was a job. You, you see, I, I always found an excuse, you know what I mean? It was the same time in the movement too. Whenever we met somebody of our enemies that was a nice guy, it was an exception. Or there was a reason for it, you know? We even had sometimes left-wing people that we met, and they were cool. That wouldn't fit in your, in, your, in your ideology, you know? It's messing with your head. Hey, I'm supposed to hate these people. Why are they cool? Well, it's probably just them. Either they're naive or whatever, or they're good hiding, or they have an agenda. You always had something. Or it's the token black guy, you know, the one black guy you know and you wrote down his name or whatever, and he, he's cool, but not the others, you know, exception. So that's the same what I thought about him. And at some point, he got a new computer, and that didn't work, so I helped him. At some point, that I didn't even take the money anymore. And I was like, found myself sitting sometimes an hour there trying to help him and not thinking about it anymore that I actually am supposed to hate him, you know? And... and we're talking about stuff and one time he asked me uh, if I want to come downstairs to dinner and I don't know if I thought long about it or not I can't remember but I said yes I was going downstairs I was by myself and uh, it was just weird the, the wife didn't speak much German you know the kids and 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 and, and now was like, what is now, couscous and falafel or whatever, weird stuff, I don't want to eat this. And uh, it was actually, uh, the appetizer was fish soup. And I don't, apparently that's not even something Turkish or whatever, it was just where he was from, I don't know. And I, I, I can't stand fish soup. It's it's not going down my throat, period. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is, this is what I expected. Anyway, so now I was already like, you know, these uh, cultures, when, when you tell them they don't take their generous invitation or whatever, you would, would offend them, you know, you don't take their food. I already thought, if I tell him that I don't want, want the fish soup, he will probably be offended. Actually, good test, you know, because then he will probably grow fangs, so he will, I don't know, beat me up or turn into Osama bin Laden. I don't know. I can unmask him because he was so good in hiding, hiding his real beliefs. No, Mr. Nice Guy, no, you can show your Muslim terrorist face, you know? And I was really, so I told him, I don't like fish soup. And I thought, come on, show me. Guess what happened? <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. The wife came, took the fish soup, and brought the entree. And it was chicken and fries. And I was like, where's the couscous and falafel, you know? <laughs> And I would say that seemed that seems so normal, you know. But I can who are we to to say what's normal food wise? So I was like, man, he's struggling just as I do with finances, with his kids, with his job. He's worrying about the country that he's living in, what's becoming out of that, you know? He likes the same things that I like. 
uh, music, food, movies. He even likes chicken and fries, you know? They're like, that, that was nothing left that I was supposed to hate. Over a freaking dinner, you know? And I felt like my hate was just crumbling. It was laying in front of me. All that hate was laying in crumbs. And I had to make a decision. What am I good? What am I going to do with this? With this whole situation, you know? And, of course, I had a lot of time to think in the aftermath of that. And I decided I need to find out how all the other Muslims are. Are they like him? I, I didn't see him as the landlord anymore. I didn't see him as the Turk anymore. I saw him as Himmet. That was his name. What are the others? They also have names. You see, I started humanizing them again. Seeing them as human beings, not as the landlord, not as the Turk, not as the enemy. As the enemy. And I cared for their names, and I cared for what, what they think about this country, how they came here, how they struggle, how maybe their kids struggle. Why all these kids were in Turkish gangs, you know, that we used to fight, to fight. There was a reason for that. And I realized, no, they're, they're not terrorists. They're just fathers and mothers and kids, and they worry about the same shit that I do. And they like the same things I do, and, and I just realized, okay, if this was wrong, what else has been wrong that I believed in, you know? And this is when I really was like, okay, this is, I have to, I have to un unwrap all this hate. You know, I got my hate, uh, my head out of the hate, but I had to get the hate out of my head too, now, you know? That's, that was the slowly, slow process of de-radicalization, you know? Imagine you walk into a forest and you're 10 miles into the forest Guess how long it takes out to get out of the forest? The same 10 miles, you know? And I had to do it by myself. Um, there was no groups at the time that were helping. Um, and there was a lot of struggles. There was, I still had tattoos and stuff. And I remember I had the word skinhead tattooed on my upper arm. And it was just one year after all this happened, you know? I just was still dealing with all this mess in my head. And I remember with my, with my son, and I went to a water park. And there was that that water slide and I went with my son my hand on the hand and we went up the stairs so you can get down, go down the water slide and there was a Turkish woman behind me also with her child also on the stairs and she looked at me and I already had just a regular I could just like like you I mean, there's not much left in your mouth <laughs> but, uh, back to being a skinhead <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, my hair looked normal, you know, and uh, but I had just swim trunks on, you know, and you could see the tattoo. And she saw that tattoo, and I could see the fear in her eyes because she identified skinheads as neo-Nazi, which means hate Turks. And there's a lot of things that happened in Germany over the years. So skinheads like burning Turkish family houses, you know, and women and children died and stuff. And I saw just the fear in her eyes. And I felt so helpless. I felt so freaking helpless that I didn't know what to do because should I now tell her and apologize or should I say I'm not like that anymore? I couldn't say a word, you know. I just, all I could see was that fear. I had my child here. She had her child there. And I was like, where well, are we different? And But she's afraid of this, just that word that I have tattooed here, you know. And I was like, okay, this needs to be gone. So, and, and I decided to cover this tattoo up um, and started to look for tattoo shops was really, really important for me. From that time on, every time I went to a water park, I used to Sharpie and drew something over it or uh, with duct tape. <laughs> remember one time I put a whole thing of duct tape around it and it's, it's, it was hurtful for myself. And then also to see myself as this person that I wasn't anymore. And it was just one year after it, you know, I was not even fully de-radicalized yet. It was already hurtful. And then I started to sweep everything under the carpet. I was out of the movement. I just claimed, okay, I, I realized this was wrong. I realized, okay, if all this was a lie, the, what, what about Holocaust denial? Because I had become a Holocaust denier too, you know? I realized, well, no, the Holocaust happened. I mean, we have proof. It happened. So, I'd never been to a concentration camp, you know. The, in school, there was no money for it. 
when we were in the movement. I didn't want to go and see the lies that I thought they were there. And then when I was finally out of out of the movement, I didn't want to go because I felt like you don't have to prove it to me anymore. I do now believe that it happened, okay? Um so I was like, okay, I, I don't want I, I don't want to have anything to do with this person that I used to be. Swept it under the carpet, didn't talk to many people about it, just scratched the surface a little bit when I said just that I used to be a right wing idiot, period. Not the whole extent. Not that I was a leader of a group and, and musician and all this stuff. And for almost ten years I lived this life. Uh until I finally even started make, make music again, you know. Um, but not, not talking about that at all until, until I had to, because I was brutally outed by the media. And, uh, so it was my coming out and I was not in charge of it. And if you're not in in charge of your coming out, it's not good. And first I was completely in defense mode because I was like, I don't want to talk about this. This is not me anymore. And I wasn't that bad anyway, you know, and. But that was that was an extremely bad situation. See the KKK, obviously in Germany, America, UK. When I think of the KKK in America, it's, if, when you see the movies, it's just as if they hate black people. But you hating Jews, you're hating Muslim, you're hating black, you're hating left wing. Oh, they is hate everybody the, too. Is that the same in America? It's the same because they also, seem more ruthless though with the hangings and the burnings and the. Is that true? Y- yes, yes, and no. It is. It is like. Um, that's not the KKK. Just to try to keep it really short, the KKK, as itself, was the first era was from uh, 1865 when it was founded on Christmas Eve in Tennessee until I believe 1876 or something. It was actually forbidden and banned, and there's it's called the Ku Klux Klan Act. It was for banned and bidden, uh, for, <laughs> forbidden and banned as a terrorist organization. In, in 1877, I believe. And uh, it was revived in 1915. It, it was a book that was made into a movie, Birth of a Nation. Unfortunately, it is a cinematic masterpiece and is used by a lot of uh, filmmakers as an example because how the camera work is done, it's a really important film, unfortunately. Uh, but it's like two and a half hours long and it's glorifying the KKK, how it's saving white women from black rapists after after um the civil war the freed slaves that all of a sudden like wild animals jumping onto the white women that's how it was depicted and the heroic chivalric, chivalric clan is coming and helping uh 1915 in the middle of uh world war one and well pretty much all of white america was racist at the time it was the white supremacists so it just reflected what society thought anyway so some guy revived the clan. It was the second era, and then it was the third era during uh, the 2030s, 40s. And then the clan was uh, disbanded because of uh, tax reasons, because they couldn't pay their taxes, that millions of members didn't pay their taxes. And then they were almost dead in the 50s, revived again. Then there was in the 60s, when the most violent times of the clan actually happened. Uh, because of the civil rights movement. And uh, a lot of people in the South that were involved in the Klan um, just went and did, like, the Alabama, the Birmingham church bombing, for example. And six little children were murdered. Or, uh, um, amongst others, from the Mississippi burning murders, for example, when, when uh, uh, it was two Jews and a black guy were murdered in Mississippi by the clan and so on. And that happened really. And the, the, the cross burnings, when they went and put a burning cross in your front yard, that happened to, to Dr. King several times. Um, that time existed in the clan in the 60s. Um, and the, actually the death of the influ- influential clan came in the 1960s when the government, when the FBI came down from Washington to the South, smacked down on the Klan and sent a lot of the leaders to prison. And then all the people that were in power, like sheriffs and whatever, they were like, okay, we can't be in these groups anymore because it's too dangerous. We will be held responsible, even though they didn't do the crimes. But if some members of your group are doing the crime, you're going to prison. That's like what the cops told me, you know? 
So as a leader, you're responsible for your group. And that was the death of that violent plan from the 60s. It was revived again after uh, Vietnam. A lot of Vietnamese fishers came, uh, immigrants. You had a lot in, in Texas and Louisiana. Um, Vietnamese people were attacked by groups and that, that revived the Klan in the 1980s. Um, in general, there are skinheads, trailer park trash joined the Klan. So you have different eras there. And even uh, after so the 1960s, 50s already, since the Klan couldn't um, operate under the old name, name anymore because they had tax debt. <laughs> Whoever would use the same name had to, to pick up the tax debt, you know, the bill. So they split up and everybody, and th this is, it's great if you go, go to an organization, everybody can be the leader, right? <laughs> That's what happened. All these small leaders, state leaders could be the imperial wizard, the nationwide leader all of a sudden because they all opened their own group. You know, it was not the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan anymore. Then you had the Magnolia Knights and these Knights and the Mississippi Knights and everybody had a prefix, the United Clans of America and, and so on. How and, many different levels are there for the KKK? Um, you you have um, on the top you have the Imperial Wizard. He's like the president, and then you have uh, he's got his Imperial officers, which you have like a vice president and uh, and a scribe, and and you have uh, a treasurer and so on, and security officers and so on, and a couple of religious positions as well. Then you have the state level; it's uh, handled by the Grand Dragon. And then you have your grand officers. And then you have under that, it goes, you have um, great titans. They uh, cover dominions, which, which often is for a whole area in a state. And then on the county level, you have your clavern um, that is um, led by the exalted cyclops. What's that? The exalted cyclops, that's the local leader. What is that of all these names, all these mystic names just to make it even more interesting, more secretive, and so on. What's the meaning behind the burning of the cross? Um, they say at least it comes from the Scottish clans when they uh, uh, signalized that it was about danger or whatever you put uh, 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 on the highlands. You burn the cross to signalize the other clans of the danger. That's where it was inspired from. But uh, a lot of people say, too, it's also because of uh, Christianity. When uh, Emperor Constantine um, converted to Christianity, he saw he, he saw the lit-up cross in the sky, and it was his calling to, I have to convert to Christianity so I can win this battle. So there's different ones. The clan um, says they're, they're Christian, so... That's why they're using the cross. And you have a difference between the burning cross and the lit cross. You have a boss cross burning, which is used for intimidation, which was put out by the night riders and put out in the front yards to intimidate people. And you have the cross lighting, which is a ceremony. Um, that's when the clansmen wear their ropes and everything, stand around the cross and light it and... What's the meaning of that? When what's the meaning of the robes? Why wear the robes, the white robes? Well, originally it was just to, just to to pretend to be ghosts, and they were scaring black people, the freed slaves, and so these uh, six Confederate uh, um, soldiers that started the Klan in 1865 were riding around and just scaring a couple of freed black slaves, and that oh, we are the resurrected dead. Confederate soldiers and and did stuff like holding a bone out of the from under the rope, just pretending to be a skeleton or whatever, and thought the naive black slaves will fall for that, intimidate them, and then they just started creating titles and whatever, and later they claimed it's um, also to hide your identity, but not as a, in form of of hiding your identity to to escape responsibility but to claim we're all the same under the rope. No matter what, what social status you have, if you're the president or whatever, under this robe and under the hood and under the mask, we're all the same. See, when you were full of your hate and you became a father, how, how was that? Obviously, it would have been different when you started making changes, but when you're full of hate, did you try and be 
a normal father? Or were you still angry at the world trying to protect oh, no, your no, kids? Was, or were my, you were you feed, feeding your kids with the same information you had at life that time? When my kid kids were born, I was on the on, on the height of my age. I sometimes even took them to to events and whatever. <laughs> I I never talked. I'm laughing because it's yeah, it's up. absurd. It's <laughs> absurd. Um, the thing is, I never taught my children all the stuff. I never told them you have to hate somebody. I never told them this. They they were fed with all stuff. They heard the music, and I took them when I had some acoustic concerts. My oldest son, he was five six at the time. He would come a couple of times. Uh, when we had people at the house, they they saw them. I mean, they 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 heard all the stuff. But I always thought if I teach him that, if I push it too hard on him, what do kids do when the parents tell them what they have to do? They're the opposite, <laughs> right? So I thought, well, I'm trying to be smart. I'm not telling him anything. He will just find out. And <laughs> funny anecdote here. I was like the leader of the clan group and I had like 20 clansmen in my living room. We had the, this big window. Just imagine here. It was twice, three times as big as just this whole front here. And we're sitting there and, and my son had befriended the neighbor's kid who was a mixed kid. The mother came home from the Dominican Republic with a, with a child, you know. So uh, the little town and then the black kid there. And who wants to be his best friend? My son. And I was the grand dragon of the clan, okay? And I was the same. Like, if I tell him not to play with him, he will do it anyway, right? I, I have no chance. I can't, I can't win this battle, okay? So I just let him do whatever. And we're sitting there with 20 clansmen, like, in this thing. And all of a sudden, you can see my son is coming down on his bicycle. And the black kid is behind him on his bicycle. And all the clansmen are like... What the F is this? I was like, oh, um, um, I said, look, look, again, you know, if I push everything too hard on him, he will just do the opposite anyway. And I just let him be his friend because he will learn it the hard way. The black kid will probably start stealing stuff, break his bike, and be an asshole to him. He will just learn it firsthand how it is, okay? I'm like, you're smart. That's good. <laughs> it's like, Phew. So, when I thought my, my kids were also much smarter than I, they never got into this stuff. So I'm I'm really glad they're all grown up. Well, you're concerned that they followed the foot, same footsteps. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, especially after, not long after this happened with my Turkish landlord and this this, this famous dinner scene, you know, that made me think and everything. Um, I separated from my ex-wife because she did not change her beliefs for a longer time. It was one of, one of the reasons. There was other stuff too. I mean, it's, it was a divorce period. Um, but um, I, I wasn't in touch with my kids for a longer time, and I was very concerned that they get into this stuff and and into the movement because and, of their mum. No, also because of me. Because uh, I mean, at least until my son was like almost ten, and and my daughter was seven, and my youngest son was six. You know, they've seen all this stuff. You know, um, ah. I could have blamed her partly for that, you know, because she stayed longer and, and I didn't know if she was pushing it on them. But for the first 10 years of my son's life, I, I was around. I mean, I was nobody else to blame but, but me in this case. And I was really concerned for a while and then I found out, okay, they're all fine. So they were much smarter than I. Mm -hmm. And I'm really happy about that. See, when you were full of hate, when you seen a black person, what was that rage? Was there an anger inside or a rage that they shouldn't be it was, here? It was, it was yeah, you, you, sh you shouldn't be here. Um, but I was smart enough also, well, beating the person up this is, doesn't help anybody, you know? It's just, okay, I was convinced we had to get rid of these people, and then I saw a mixed couple. I was extremely enraged because uh, in, in younger days because I was just fed and t taught. That it's a no-go. Later, when I was in the clan, I backed it up with a, with some Bible quotes that we said were against race mixing and all this stuff. And uh, so I was extremely uh, outraged and, and, and was like, hey, we have to do something against this. This has to be outlawed and banned and sent all the black people back. And, and I even taught, taught my members and said, 
we don't we don't need to hate black people. Okay, we don't like them, but are you concerned about them in Africa? No, say so. You don't really hate them, right? Just send them back to Africa, and, and, and we're good. We just love our own people. We just want to be here amongst ourselves and be in charge. So this is how we lie to ourselves, you know. And of course, we hated them. Um, but it was just like, like you said, what was the goal? Taking over, in this case, with a clan, um, infiltrate society, put them in, in positions of political power. And again, we, we were there. I mean, we were business people, we had cops and so on. I said, okay, now we just need this. And just if I can convince business people and cops to join our group, you know, I can convince other people like judges or politicians or groom our members that we already have to run for office, to join regular parties, not right-wing parties, just the socialists or the Christian Democrats or whatever. It doesn't matter. Names don't matter. We infiltrate them, we run for office, and we will have the power. That was the plan. And how many people would you have needed in power for your plan? What, what was your whole outcome, the plan, to then change the world, the whole world being white? Like, what was the whole... I, I, th I think most people it was realistic no realistically most people in this movement don't think that far it's the same like like with the skinheads you know they were always like for some time a lot of the skinheads were like the foot soldiers of the neo-nazis like after the Berlin Wall fell you know a lot of the skinheads got into this trap of the neo-nazis you know and became a foot soldiers, even though they knew what happens, because the neo-Nazis told them sometimes, you know, when we take over, what, what will happen to you, skinheads? Think what Hitler did with, with, with the Sturmabteilung, you know, with the brown shirts. They were disbanded, the leaders were killed, and there was only the SS left, the black shirts, you know? We'll do the same with you. Or you go to the concentration camp, work, labor camp, that's where you will go. We don't need you. You're anti-social as socials. We don't need you. How we'll, many people were in the Klu Klux Klan? Um, our, again, our group was... was All around. Oh, again. Tens have, of you, thousands? Yeah, it's, uh, I, th I think now it's worldwide. Oh, in the US, there's probably a number of, of in the lower thousands, probably. Is it dying, dying off? Oh, yes. But every yes. time you've spoke, it seems as if it can come back again it, it can come back again but the problem now is it, it always when it died back it came back something revived it like a war like 9 11 so bin laden is that oh, yeah, absolutely is that an excuse to then black people and muslims are trying to take over the yeah, world or yeah. when obama was president was also an excuse oh we don't want we we need to take our country back again there was one clan leader actually said trump is the worst thing that ever happened to the clan <laughs> because Everybody's just voting Trump. It's like nobody needs a clan anymore. <laughs> That's what they literally said. We need somebody like Obama that we can be against so we get more members. So they're not even concerned about what happens when you win. You know, that's that's like all these groups. That you don't even think that far. You don't have a plan. Um, they're always waiting for excuses to... Yeah. We, we, like with the one neo-Nazi party, we had like classes and whatever. We we're talking about... Sorry. We're talking about um, when we take over, how, how do you form a government? There were thoughts about it, but uh, most groups are really not thinking that far. You know, most groups thinking just <laughs> just what happens the next day, you know, it's, it's because you're, you're like we did it too, because you were waking up in the morning. It was just exhausting. You didn't even have time to think what happens next week, you know? Yeah. So you're going through your changes then. You end up meeting a Turkish man who you who you thought would be the enemy and full of hate and waiting for the telltale signs why you hate him. You never found them. You realise that people, we all bleed the same. Yes, there's arseholes in every colour on this planet. There's arseholes yeah. in every but it took a religion. While. There's arseholes in every race. There's just It's just the way it is. But when you started making the changes, how hard was it to get out? Could, you, was, could there be a chance of you being killed off because of the information that you had, or was that too far-fetched? Um, I never thought about it for 10 years because, I, again, I swept it under the carpet. I didn't want to talk about it, just for myself, self-protection. Did you stay in it for another 10 years, or did you come out? How did you get out of it? 
Well, I, I got out well, when, when, when I uh, met the Turkish landlord and all this stuff happened, but you can know? You, can you just leave easily? Yeah, no, no, you, you can leave. Like, it's, it's, um, that movement is like a revolving door. The fluctuation is so high mm -hmm. that you're so busy recruiting new members that you don't have time to keep the leaving ones. Unless they have really, really high knowledge of something illegal, mm -hmm. then you might. Or if it's like here in the U.S., if it has to do with prison gangs like the Aryan Brotherhood, for example, or other uh, prison gangs that are organized and, uh, like that, or have the similar structure because there's often money and drugs involved. And when these members are leaving, well, that, that puts your empire in, in danger, you know? So you try to keep those from leaving. But of groups like the Klan or political groups or whatever, you, you, you don't even have time. And so, sometimes you just let them go because mm -hmm. somebody's just not showing up to the meetings anymore. Well, and you will have excuses. Ah, the wife, the kids, whatever, and work, and this, and this. And at some point, you just don't ask anymore. You just don't, well, okay, he's gone. He's not coming back. And for the most part, if we don't speak out, then nobody cares anyway because, okay, he, and then you're just gone. Mm -hmm. If you start speaking out, it looks a little bit different. But most of the groups still don't do anything. It's not like, again, it's not like the prison gang that comes after you. Um, it's it's not really like this. Uh, it ha there were incidents where it has happened, but in, in general, it really doesn't. Um, unless you have really knowledge and would, would maybe op would cooperate like, with the FBI and really bust a group, mm -hmm. that would be different. But I didn't have these concerns, especially not in those 10 years. I was out of the movement. I tried to pretend uh, or think I, I'm a normal member of society. I just don't want to talk about this until I was forced to. One reason why I never talked about it was also fear, fear of rejection. If they find out about my past, will they believe me? Who? Yeah society whoever i tell whoever i tell it normal people could be society it could be family it could be having family knew about it that i used to be that person but everybody my new friends and i had a lot of turkish friends all of a sudden you know um i ran two companies and i had uh, um i helped uh, um, an organization that helped a young turkish um teenagers that got in trouble with the law getting back into society and, and get them apprenticeships and stuff like that just because I thought it was the right thing, not even to make anything up or whatever or make, make, make up for what I did bad. But what if all these people find out about my past? Will they believe me? Will they still want me as a friend, as a boss, as a, as a co-worker, as whatever, you know? Who believes a Nazi or who wants to talk to Nazi? Who believes people like that can change? And I still had like two or three tat tattoos, <laughs> knocking the whole table over here. Um, you know, this. Um, see, it's a very emotional topic, you know. Yeah, it's good though. The uh, and you have a couple of tattoos, you know. You you just you 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 don't want to admit that to yourself that you have been a person, and just a fear of rejection. And when when I was outed, because I was all over the newspaper. What actually, what actually caught up was, um, also long story short, they dug out that the cops, that the clan had cops as members. That was one of the big things. And there was other things that happened in Germany with that uh, National Socialist Underground that, that was covered, uh, discovered there and so on. And they, of course, were crazy and looked at everything that had to do with the movement and whatever. And so they wanted to know who's the man who led this KKK group. And that was me. And all of a sudden, I was like on all newspapers, on front pages and whatever. And I was like, oh, just leave me alone, you know? And um, and also, a lot of people didn't believe it. You know, here in, in America, it's easy. America loves redemption. <laughs> Germany, sometimes. But it's getting really hard when it comes to Nazis, <laughs> neo-Nazis, for a very good reason. Look at the history, you know? It's a little bit tricky. So very often, people don't believe you when you leave the the neo Nazi movement that you have changed. It's like, oh, once a Nazi, always a Nazi, people don't change and so on. Um so I felt like I'm fighting a, a, a battle that I can't win. It's it's like really, really hard. 
And at some point, it was just, I was so pissed off by that country that I decided, well, I always wanted to be in the U.S. <laughs> and I had a friend in the music industry, and I was calling him up, and I said, look, I always want, I already wanted to come last year. I had a job offer that didn't work out as a um, music executive. I said, but now this, this is the situation. I, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm, I'm coming. So I invested some money. We wanted to open up a record, music recording studio. And I was like, okay, I'm emigrating. <laughs> and that's where I then met my wife a little bit later. And married her, and uh, then after a couple of years, somebody dug the whole story out again, and I was like, oh, will this ever stop? I don't want to be connected to this person that I used to be anymore. This is not me anymore. I don't want it. I don't want the person. I don't want to think about it. I don't even understand at the time how I got into that mess. I don't even understood at the time how I got out. That took all time of reflection to understand all this package, you know? And I was out of a big newspaper article again, and I was like, okay, my life is over again. Why is this happening all the time? And I realized, well, it's like, you know, it's like poop. <laughs> it it always comes up to the surface, and if you got it on you, it will stink. You can wash it up <laughs> off so and so often, but it will stick on you, okay? And that's, that's my past. I, I, I have to deal with it. I just have to. And I realized when it came out here in the U.S. that people, compared to Germany, where they were like, oh, we don't know if we believe you, you know? People here were applauding me and like, oh, this is cool that you left. And how did you do this? We want to hear a story. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? You know? But it encouraged me. And then I got in touch with groups that helped people leave that movement, even though I didn't need the help anymore, but it encouraged me to talk about it, to reflect on it, to write about it. And then finally, you know, and I moved to Memphis. 70% black population in Memphis. So I had the chance to get in touch with the black community. And I realized, well, those kids are just the same as my kids, you know, the parents are just as concerned as I am. I just learned... They're just people. And guess what? They like chicken and fries too. I was like, dang, they're just like you and me. And when I got in touch, actually, with um, that was some something real life changing. My first time in LA, some students found me and made a film about me. They just thought I'm interesting enough for their for their for their film, and flew me out there. Um, and I went to a museum there. It's run by the Simon Luis and Toll Center. So if you're ever in LA, go to the Museum of Tolerance. It's really, really great. And I went there and they have a Holocaust exhibit there. And I told you I've never been to a concentration camp for all these reasons. Well, I pushed it away, you know, and I uh, went through there. And of course, a lot of pictures I had seen on TV and whatever, but they have also this kind of replica of a gas chamber at the end of their exhibit. It's called the Hall of Testimonies. It looks like a gas chamber, and it's a little dim light, and they pl play a couple of films of people that made it through the Holocaust. And I was, when I got out there, I talked to the guy who worked there, which is, who is, by the way, also a real Nazi hunter. Um, that's a different story. And I said, I, I need to, I just realized I... What's a Nazi hunter? Uh, and that, somebody who hunts real Nazis, he went like to, he was responsible that a real war criminal was caught in Buenos Aires. He went undercover to Germany and to Buenos Aires until the guy could have been, could have, uh, was able to be caught or convicted in Germany and had to go to prison. So these are really, really freaking heroes, you know? And, uh, and I, I met the guy there and he's, he was working for the museum and, uh, I said, I realized I never reflected on, on my past as an anti-Semite because I never had a chance to. And I was like, this is this this visit did something with me. I need to work with you guys. So, and after, I don't know, after, that was in 2018. Yeah, 2018. And we didn't exactly know what we were going to do. And then Pitt in Pittsburgh, the... Uh, synagogue was attacked there and 11 people were killed in Pittsburgh. Uh, it was a really big deal. And that was like kind of the wake up call. And the San Luis and Center was like, TM, we're going to do something. 
you're going to start telling your story. We're sending you to universities. And within two days, I was up and did my first lecture at a university in Boston. I started traveling with them and started getting to know the Jewish community. And I was like, dang, what, what happened? They look all so different. Because I remember the picture I, I remembered from elementary school at the temple in Jerusalem, you know, with a black hat and, and, and locks. And I thought they all eat, fill the fish, you know, <laughs> and stuff. And, and they, they're just normal people, you know. And I was like, they're just like you and me. And guess what? They also like chicken and fries, you know. Like, I'll be damned. This is every time I, I, I just learned something and the people that I once hated, I was taught that I was wrong. And uh, this is just crazy. And, and I just had to realize I have to do so much more. This is also when we created the tattoo campaign. Um, we have a campaign now after COVID. It's not as big anymore, but in the years from 2017 to 2020, uh, we started teaming up with a tattoo studio and offered to cover up hate tattoos for free, hate and gang tattoos. Because I remember the story when I when I saw the young Turkish woman, you know, with a child, seeing my tattoo, the fear in her eyes, and then me struggling with tattoos, you know, not wanting to be that person anymore, having other people who left hate groups struggling because they have a swastika on their chest and they can't go to the beach. They maybe don't want to show it to their kids, you know. They have it on their, on their hands, on, on their... Go to a job interview and you have a swastika on your neck. Do you believe that job recruiter will look at your resume? No, you already have lost, you know. So what can we do? We decide to help those people. We're like... Don't use the money you need for a light bill to do this stuff and cover it up. We're doing it for free. We're helping you to get back into society and start working with you. When was that light bulb moment? Because when people make changes, there's always a big cloud that pops at the top of the head when it realizes the shit that you've done and the shit that you, you hated. What was that moment? Obviously, you spoke to the Turkish guy, but again, like you say, 10 years walking, and if you yeah. want to change, go to 10 years back. So when was that light bulb moment where you realized how fucking warped your mind was and how deluded you were thinking? I didn't have that one moment. Pro just a process? It, it was a process. It was many little moments. And every, every after every little moment, I thought it was the big moment, okay? And I think a lot of other people have that too. They have their big moment, when they start thinking and then they on their whole the 10 miles that have to walk out of the forest again they pass a lot of trees you know and all these trees are like moments that they have to pass you know and when it pops again another cloud pops and i'm like this too and this too and gay people are normal too and these people are normal too and what what, what was i thinking you know and there's no conspiracy and these movies are actually cool oh i can actually start watching watching seinfeld again it's nothing bad about it, you know, and then all, all this stuff, you know, and it's like... Why was gay people hated on? Um, because society tells you to. <laughs> society in general, I guess. And also, uh, gay people are often depicted as fat, feminine, not masculine enough. So it's abnormal, I guess. And uh, I don't know. I guess it's I, I guess it's not even uh, that much of a movement problem, a hate group problem. I mean, look at look at the USA, how, how they behave. <laughs> they try to cover, back it up with the Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. So how do you then? How long's it took now? How long's that process been to kind of cleanse from that hated, that heart of blackness and dark kind of? Void, how long did that take to really cleanse where you started believing that you were changing yourself? I think that was pretty quick. I think that was like in the first year that I, that I really, really genuinely could say to myself, I don't hate these people anymore. Um, 
sometimes uh, uh, in all these years there were flashbacks and now with everybody who has been in these groups and i know you have interviewed a lot of former gang members of other things and they always have these flashbacks where they have to deal with stuff they know we have to reteach themselves or or you see something that fulfills stereotypes you know when you see the black guy that fulfills all the stereotypes that we said about them and yes they exist of course they exist. I mean, you have all white people that ful fulfill stereotypes that Chinese people have about them, you know? So therefore you have black people, for example, that fulfill stereotypes that we believed in them. And yeah, and I run across these people. It happens. Well, that's just some people that fulfill a stereotype that doesn't represent a whole race or a whole culture, you know? That's when you see these people and think, oh, that's exactly what we're talking about. But at the same time, you know, I already know I, it's not a problem because I know it's it's one case where I can have 10 cases who are white people who behave the same way. You know what I mean? Well, no, it's not a racial thing. It's not a cultural thing. It's just one person that fulfills those stereotypes who happens to be black. Or somebody, I mean, I'm uh, in the Jewish community. Um, so... I met a lot of people in the Jewish community and I converted to Judaism myself last year. And yes, I met stereotypical Jews that m fulfilled all the stereotypes that I had. Yeah, because these people exist. But you know, I have 10 white people or 10 yellow people or 10 whatever people that fulfill the same stereotypes as well. Just because of one per one of these twenty people that fulfill all these stereotypes happens to be Jewish, doesn't mean he represents the whole Jewish community. Does it make sense? Yeah, it's like a federalist. There's there's a few of them, same as anything. People are getting told to what to do and brainwashed and groomed. It doesn't mean right. every Muslim man is bad and every color is bad because one person does a shitty thing. How do you feel? Do you get emotional if a black man or a gay man does something good for you and you think like? I hate it on you. Do you feel a sense of guilt or are you past all that now? Uh, I used to have a lot of guilt about that. And I was like, I don't deserve this. Why are you doing this to me? Why? Uh, why? Just just a why. Um, I think for the most part, I'm over it. I'm just sometimes amazed because it's always, always black people or Jews or whatever or all that help. Whenever we need help or whatever, it's 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 always the people I hated. It's like, am I just a magnet for that, or is it just the kind of people that like to help? You know, and I just never wanted to see it back in the day. You know, I don't know. Um, these are, of course, things that I that I see, mm -hmm. but um, I don't think anymore that I don't deserve it. But I, I had these times. Mm -hmm that I thought, I don't deserve this. And I had one thing actually that helped me with it was um, in the black community in Memphis, and there's a museum. And I was asked, they knew about my past, and it wasn't 2018, 19. And they had actually a, a, a podiums event, a discussion event. It had to do with colleges. It had nothing to do with white supremacy, racism, or whatever, my past whatsoever. And I was asked to be a speaker on there because I used to be a job recruiter. It was about job recruiting and, and colleges. I said, sure, why not? And it felt good to be asked for something else, not talking about my past all the time, you know? And so this is cool. And so I talked to the organizer, and she was like, the next day, we talked about something, and she was like, you know? She said, she talked to her husband last, last night and he asked who's on the panel. And she said, well, Dr. AC, blah, blah, blah. And I said, and a former white supremacist. And I was like, okay. I said, yeah, but it's a problem. I said, why? She was like, because I don't even know if you want to be labeled as such. And I was like, it's what it is. I mean, that's that's what I am. But she said, it has nothing to do with the event, and she just labeled me as such. And uh, she said that there was the first time when somebody asked me as what I want to be introduced, and not just labeled me. And she came up, well, actually, you're, you're a human rights activist. 
I was like, okay, hey, that's cool. I like this. And and I was like, why is this black person so concerned about me, how I feel about being labeled as a white supremacist, a former white supremacist, which is absolutely the truth. I'm a former white supremacist, so it is what it is. And she said, because she said, this is how black people feel all the time. They're labeled for something that they're not, that, that doesn't represent them. It might be a stereotype, it might be a fact or whatever, but it doesn't re represent them as a person, that label. And she apologized that she labeled me and asked me, again, what I was, what to introduce them. And she was like, it's a typical problem minorities have. And this was also a, a moment that changed my thinking about this topic, where I thought, okay, I, I need to stop feeling guilty you know I need to stop feeling guilty or, or or if I deserve it if somebody does something good for me who's who's one of the minority groups that I used to hate there was a teaching moment as well mm -hmm. what in your own opinion what do you think needs to happen for racism to stop I think one or two more generations I, th I think we're on a good way. I think with the internet, with education that's out there, if you look at young people, they're really open. They're really open for this world. They see the world as it is. And I think, especially my generation, I'm not 48 years old, we still have to be role models and not give up the fight for that and still fight against racism. We just can't give it up and think, our kids and their kids will fix that. If they don't see us fighting for it, they don't need to see, see a, a reason to fight for it. But I think that the next the upcoming generations are really walking through this world with much more open eyes. Yeah, you've got to. I think a lot of people, what helps as well, a lot more people now are a lot more traveled. They travel more so they can see for themselves that people ain't bad. The media can portray so much of what they want you to think. Mm -hmm. But once you actually travel, I've been everywhere around the world and everybody's been so friendly. I don't, I'm not there to piss people off or talk shit. Even your story today, it's, it's unbelievable from where you came from to what you're doing. And it's important for people. These are educational because I'm learning. I, I genuinely don't know. And, and like I say, I'm not left wing, right wing. I couldn't give a fuck about politics, wars religions for me i'm very open-minded to it if you're happy by doing that and choosing that by all means i support you i'm just open-minded to all because there was a time i loved cocaine i loved alcohol i loved gambling that that was normal for me then and then when i think about it i think how fucking deluded i was so when people choose different religions different beliefs and whether they want to be straight gay bi i have no issues with nothing as long as you're not harming anyone as Correct. long as you're leaving the kids alone as well don't fucking force your agenda and your own beliefs and your own sexuality and whatever it is you want onto kids because kids, let them play, let them get into nature, let them fucking enjoy their life, make the mistakes. And by all means, if they're confused at 16 and 18 they think something's wrong, you can speak to them. You can, they can be open-minded, but just keep shit away from kids because, like you say, people can be brainwashed. You were brainwashed at 14, oh, yeah, 15. Absolutely. And it's easy done. Human beings are vulnerable. We are very vulnerable and sensitive towards anything. And we're always looking for a leader. Every human wants to be guided because we don't know really what the fuck is going on in life. We genuinely don't know. Mm -hmm. We're kind of just going through it thinking, am I doing it right? So we're kind of easily manipulated to follow something, but just make sure you're following the right thing. Yeah, that's a problem. Humans need to be led and they want to be, need to be led and they want to be led. Um, problem is, because you, you think only so far, you know, because you're, you're busy with your own stuff and yeah. there's things you just don't understand and the regular peasant you know doesn't understand a lot of things you know and, and that, that's all perfectly fine and okay but it's much easier to fall and a lot of leaders are just taking that to their advantage and brainwash people just to be in power and we see that every day in this world in almost every country on this planet yeah how is that when you started speaking out how did you start feeling the more you've done it that the easier it became oh absolutely um, it also helped me reflect on my on my story because my my story as I told told it to you today has changed from when I started in 2018 
to now. There's different aspects that are more important, uh, aspects that I haven't told before, uh, things that I reflect different on that I that I point out now because they're, they're much more important. I could have probably talked for another hour, you know, and 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 point out certain things that are important. Um, but it has it has helped a lot. What's your biggest regret? Um, the music that is still out there, um, that I can do nothing about it. Some of my teachings are still out there. There's nothing I can do about it. And a couple of people that I groomed that are in leading positions still today. Monsters that I created. There's nothing I can do about it. That's what I regret. Everything else, I don't. I, it made me the person I am. Without those things, I couldn't talk about it today. I couldn't keep doing what I'm doing. I couldn't. I probably wouldn't even try to make this world a better place. Um, maybe I was supposed to be that person just to do this now. Uh, I'm now out of the hate movement longer than I've been in. That was also a moment when that year happened. I was like, now I'm out longer than I've been in. That was great. And when people told me, stop beating yourself up over it. You do so many good things. Stop. And that's when I stopped regretting that part. Only the things that I can't make good anymore. That's what I regret. Because your whole life has been full of hate. The more you overthink it, you start hating yourself. So you're no different from hating someone else to hating yourself. So it's mm -hmm. a case of, listen, the past is a past. I don't give a fuck what your past is or who anybody's past is. What I care about is what you're doing with your life now. And if you're doing good and if you're trying to rectify the pain of the past and the mistakes that you've done, I think it's a, an amazing thing. And I'm proud of you. And it's Thank it you. takes a lot of fucking balls. And... I know what it's like to change. Everybody's got different levels of trauma and everybody's got different levels of beliefs and addictions and whatever it is and how they see the world. But when it comes down to it, like that's some serious shit and some serious hate you were involved in. But to then try and clean your heart and do talks and help others and help other people for the KKK and help other white supremacists and white other neo-Nazis to then try and help them change their life and say, listen, you're full of hate and rage. And it must be scary for people as well to be caught up in something and then trying to look for other avenues to get out because it's scary change is scary what do you think the biggest thing is for change time it, it takes time it takes respect it takes people that respect you uh, this sounds this sounds maybe crazy especially when it comes no not, not only hate groups but Look at these QAnon people that you had here in the U.S. or any any extremists or actually anybody you talk to. You, you can have a husband and wife. If you have two different opinions, if you tell your spouse the whole time you're right and they're wrong and you show no respect, how much will your spouse listen to you? Zero. Turn turn the back on you and not listen and at some point probably even file for divorce. Yeah, you know? Your spouse will only listen to you when you show respect and also care for what they have to say, even if you don't agree. And this is what happened to me. A lot of people have listened to me and, and what I said about about the things I believed in with, without trying to change me. Just first, okay, I can. I, I don't agree with it, but sometimes you can see through it. For example... Um, you would you would realize that a Nazi, for example, that that the hate comes from fear. If you would listen, because they're afraid of something. It's like the, the then the fear is real. It's like a child that is afraid of the monster under the bed. What do you what do you do as a parent? Do you tell your child you're stupid? There's no monster. Did you watch too much TV or whatever? No, you hug your child and show compassion, right? Because you know that fear is real. But it's not substantial because there's, you know there's no monster. And it's the same with Nazis and right-wing people. Their fears are real. When I was in there, my fears were freaking real, you know? They were real, but not substantial. I didn't know that. I thought they're substantial. The people are smarter. They, they knew they were not substantial, you know? But nobody acknowledged the fear that, this, that the fear was there. Because no, who wants to talk to a Nazi? And um, 
There's one person I encourage everybody, including you, uh, uh, look him up, Daryl Davis, um, a black man, a, a musician um, who goes to clan rallies, befriends clan people, and pulls them out Has of the clan. He's done it with thousands of people. He done it with the clan leader in, in Mississippi. Yeah, yeah well, actually, actually, he sometimes. doesn't pull them out. He 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 talks to them until they decide to to leave. You know, yeah, unbelievable. And he's he's a Is friend he of mine. Alive? Yeah, oh, yes. Oh, he's he's. Oh, bro, you need to get to see if he'll come on the podcast. Oh, absolutely. I I, I put in touch with him. He's he's, he's awesome, and, and he says the same. Um, we we, we say it's a, a walking across the cafeteria. Talk to somebody who seems different, even and it's what he did. He met with a clansman. He actually came to one of his shows. He found out the persons in the clan. It was like, why do you hate me if you don't know me? You know, and, but starting talking to each other and respecting the other person, it made it almost impossible for the clansman to disrespect him because you don't behave the way that the other person is expecting you to behave. It's like, you don't behave like the other black people. I, I know what they, you think to know, you know? And you're like, you're, you're just a person. Why, why are you listening to what I have to say? And then you start respecting your enemy. You know, when two enemies are talking, they're not fighting. Yeah, that's what that is. The world would be a better place if people could communicate better. Communication is key for finding results. And we're, we don't because, like you say, we're full of hate, we're full of ego, we're full of pride that we're right, you're wrong. It's all bullshit because we're all right and wrong. We all fuck up. We all do good. Yep. We all do bad. So for me, communication is key. You, I know you wrote a book as well. You're an author. How many books have you actually written? Um... Well, I wrote one book about business uh, years ago, and I wrote one book in German um, about part of my history. Um, unfortunately, it's it's not available anymore, and I'm about to finish my book now with a whole story ending in last year uh, called Rewired, and I'm uh, just finishing it. We're editing it. Uh, I'm looking for a publisher, by the way. Yeah, well, if anybody, where can people get in contact um, with you? Yeah. And and I'm hoping to put it out there soon. Yeah, for anybody that's watching, where can people contact you? Um, absolutely, you can go to tmgarrett.com. Mm -hmm. um, the website is back up. Uh, I'll send an email to tm at tmgarrett.com. Actually, just put my name into Google. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. all over the place. Mm -hmm. Where do you go forward for the future, brother? I keep doing what I'm doing. Um, when people approach me and, and, and need help to get out of hate groups, I try to be a helping hand um, as much as I can. You can't work, you cannot work with too many people at the same time because you need to invest some time. Um, just trying, trying to be a good person, just trying to help other people, um, encouraging others to do the same. Uh, I hope uh, the book will make an impact and, and the book will teach some people um, and follow the same path. What's the biggest life lesson that you've you've had or you've got since you've been on this planet? The life is actually very, very simple. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And don't hate people. I mean, it can be so simple. Let's just treat other people the way you want to be treated, period. Yeah. Life That's is it. simple. Men are simple. But we're confusing as well. We confuse ourselves. We overcomplicate things. Yeah, true. How do you get, just before we finish up, how do you get rid of hate? How do you get rid of rage for a man who's hated, hated many things, hated fucking politics at times, hated gays, hated blacks, hated anybody except his own little crew or belief system? Like, how do you get rid of hate in your heart? I, th I think it takes, it takes a loving person to team up with them. And also do the same thing what I said before. Just have them talk, just accept them each other and 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 leading by example and respect. Bring the humanity back. And maybe humanize the hater. And this is also important, humanize the hater, because that person dehumanizes others, including themselves. And it's not easy when I when I tell you go and humanize a hater. <laughs> go talk to, to somebody who you think is a hater or whatever. But this is what it takes and over and over and over again. This is what we do. Over and don't try to convince them. Just listen. Just show 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 some respect. It's hard. It's hard. And it's also 
And I don't say tell black people to go to talk to white people haters. No, it's actually the job of white people to do that. You know, we have the responsibility. Um, we have to go to talk to other white people who are hating and lead by example, but show respect. They're still human beings. They're fear driven. Their hate is fear driven. That, that fear is, is real. Um, and you have to talk to it over and over again. This is, it's repeating. Our brains, that's machines. It builds neural pathways and builds habits, and it takes habits like 30, 40, 50, 60 times until we just learn to drink a glass of water in the morning, you know? And now imagine you want to convince somebody they're wrong, and you expect, hey, I talked to him once, it didn't work. Of course not. If you tell yourself, I start drinking water, a glass of water, every day starting tomorrow, and you're only telling yourself to yourself tonight, you're not going to do it. Mm-hmm. You have to repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. And this is what we have to do with these people. Lead by example. How did your wife act when you told her who you used to be? <laughs> it was our second date. I believe it was the second date where I told her because I had to. I mean, I mean, uh, this is such a big package, you know, <laughs> because I knew I actually didn't want to marry anymore. But I, when we met, uh, it's one right. of those things. Uh, the first marriage, then I had a long-term relationship. I almost married, and I was like, "Oh no, this, no, it's too much. I'm not. No, 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 no. Yep, and no, I didn't want to do it anymore. But we met, and it's one of those things. You know, when you know, you know, you you know. And I knew. I just knew this is this is it, and I knew I had to talk about this part of my life. As soon as possible, before we get too much involved, and, and then uh, it might be a deal breaker, and I need to know now it's a deal breaker. And that's what we did. And What did she say? Well, she said, that's not the person you're now anymore. She accepted that? Yeah. How was that, being accepted? It was good, being unconditionally accepted. And that there is what it's all about. Unconditionally love, under, understanding of people, and that there's a true source of what would make the world a better place. Thank you. Just before we finish up, brother, for anybody that's maybe in a life of struggle right now, what advice would you have for them? Talk to somebody about it. And for those who are on the other side, also talk to those people about it. But talk. Go talk about it. There's always somebody who will listen. And if you go out there and you struggle, somebody is there. There's Or go online Look who can help you. There's groups that that can help you. Or just look me up on the internet and send me an email. T, listen, for coming on today, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think it's unbelievable from where you came from to what you're doing now. It's totally night and day. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. Would you like to finish up on anything else? Oh, unconditional love, that's it. Thank you. My brother. Listen, God bless you. Well done. <laughs>